Hello, welcome to Jordan Sorcery's GW Books Club. This month, we're reading Wolf Riders, the second anthology of short stories set in the Warhammer Fantasy universe. There are eight tales of grim and perilous adventure, including the second Gotrek and Felix story by William King, a Drakenfels prequel, sort of, by Kim Newman writing as Jack Yeovil, and a noir-inspired detective story set in the old world's greatest port city, Marienburg. There are a bunch of fun and interesting stories here. My friend Stu and I will be delving into each of these stories in turn, but before every one, I will provide a bit of a pricey of the events therein, starting with Wolf Riders by William King. Our old friend Felix Jaeger finds himself in trouble, getting into a bar fight in defence of a pretty young woman's dignity. The timely intervention of dwarf troll slayer Gotrek ensures that Felix comes through things just fine, and then gives him a chance to befriend the damsel, Kirsten. After discovering that she is part of a caravan, Felix convinces Gotrek to join up, and the two defend the wagons from skeletons and gobos, and all the while Felix and Kirsten become closer. After settling in an abandoned fort in the Border Princes, the people of the caravan, followers of an ousted baron, are forced to defend themselves against an enormous greenskin horde. Whilst Gotrek becomes an engine of destruction, Felix discovers that the would-be Baron has slaughtered many of his own followers, including Kirsten, due to some kind of chaos-induced madness, a self-fulfilling fear of chaotic curses. Devastated by his loss, Felix recommits to his oath, and now both Gotrek and Felix set out in search of some form of redemption. So, Stu, we'll start with Wolf Riders by William King, what did you think of this, the second Gotrek and Felix story? I think you can guess what I'm going to say with this one, can't you? It's, uh, you know I'm a bit of a, a fan of Gotrek and Felix, and this was a story I'm very, very familiar with, having read it to my son, having read it years and years ago, quite a few times, and then recently listened to the audiobook, and I've also listened to the, the podcast as well, so I had it read by other people. I, I, I love the story. Um, been fond of it years, so it's one thing. Oh, it's probably the only story so far I probably didn't need to read on that. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to test me on it now, but um, <laughs> I, I like it. It's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. I think we talk about the Warhammerishness of some of these stories quite often, and it, it feels um, spoiler probably the most Warhammer of those stories in this book, um, or at least that style of Warhammer that's still recognisable within Warhammer today. Whereas mm. some of the other themes have probably been aged out of the of the canon and maybe over the years. Um, but I, yeah, I just like it. I think you see the development between the the two cases. The second is it the first, I think it's the first story in Troll Slayer. I think it's out in that order. But it's it's still early days in their relationship, and you're seeing the the development of 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 their sort of the way they react with each other and mm. Felix's. Um, guilt and you see him falling for girls which he, he does throughout the series in many different times and you see his kind of the guilt between wanting to stay with the with the troll slayer but also that kind of is this it now can i not go off and do my own thing but i love it i love i love the themes um you see you see goblins in it you see warhammery things um and you get some nice kind of interesting interplays with the von deals and the idea of of the hidden curse and secrets and the border princes, lots of stuff I love about Warhammer. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point about because it feels like William King is one of the authors so far in GW books who is the most steeped in what I would consider to be the sort of Warhammer world, the, the sort of more recognizable one, as you say. And yeah. he really finds ways to bring that to life. And that might be throwaway references, it might be the way certain characters interact, even the fact that, like you say, there's there are goblins in this which we don't seem to see for some reason in many of these stories. There is a dwarf in this, which we also don't seem to see. You know, in, uh, So you, you're getting these different aspects of the Warhammer world in the characters and the protagonists and the mm -hmm. villains and stuff like that. But then the story itself does feel very close to Warhammer Fantasy roleplay again. So yeah. in the first the first story, Geheimnisnacht, which was very much an adventure for a mm -hmm. Warhammer Fantasy roleplay play party it felt like this yeah. one feels like the backstory for a warhammer yes. fantasy roleplay pc in in felix's tale um mm -hmm. and yeah it's not the most complex story and there's maybe some elements that haven't aged that well which we can come to um just in terms of tropes and stuff like that and devices within storytelling 
But as a story itself, as the second story about these characters, Godric the Troll Slayer and Felix, his human friend who's made an oath to follow him, this really did feel like it span expanded their sort of story and gave me, who this is the first time I'm reading these stories, it gave me like way more of a sort of depth to the to the yeah. characters. Uh, and it, it was effective in saying, okay, let's find out more about Felix now. And I hope that the third story, which we'll get in the next anthology, does a little bit more on the Gotrek side as well and, and gives us more of his backstory and, you know, mm -hmm. continues that tale. So very effective kind of Empire Strikes Back middle story out of three, it felt <laughs> like to me. Yeah, I suppose it could work that way. I haven't thought of it that way because I still find it hard to separate these stories from Troll Slayer as a book because that was the mm. first time I experienced them. And then you go on that. While they're all short stories, it does also feel chronological so to speak um and even that the second book and this is going off topic a little bit even the second book while they asked short stories it feels like one whole narrative brought together into to short stories is not till they sort of move on to later books that they become singular novels so to speak so i still see it within the context of their overall story rather mm -hmm. than it kind of being a three-part spread over some 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 sort of compilation books like this one but um i i think again as we're comparing it to the other stories in this book the the warhammerness from it is he seems to be he gets dwarves he gets empire humans maybe better than some of the other stories do they're definitely recognizable i mm. would say as the empire was in eighth edition but also that warhammer fantasy roleplay empire it fits either way nothing seems too far out of kilter but he, you know, there are goblins in it that are recognisable as goblins, and there are. He seems to get chaos the way you would see it on the tabletop. Which, again, if you've come from this as a from a get war gamer's perspective, you expect to see it in that way. Um, and and I just think that that, that works and it's instantly recognisable. And it's the kind of thing that a young Warhammer player, which is what these were aimed at, would want to see. Mm. Um, and. Yeah, and then you chuck in chuck in a girl, and you know, and a bit of <laughs> sadness and a bit of grimness at times, and things as well. And a, yeah, absolutely. And a, and a good guy that's a turns out to be a a, a bad guy, or is he? Or is he just? And you still got that interplay with chaos a little bit. Is he just twisted? Did he mean to be bad, or is he evil? And at the end, you think, yeah, he's a bit of a. But you know, was Would he you, always that way? Yeah, or does he just and... feel forced into that? And it's <laughs> you've still got those those underlying kind of. Should I feel sorry for people that have been tainted by chaos? And I still think that there is an element there of yes, yes, you should. It's not you know they haven't all chosen that. It's weakness, or they've been tricked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I like that. I think it's good. Yeah, there's definitely that because you chaos is this kind of insidious force underneath the surface within the empire. Is the classic Warhammer fantasy role play version of chaos because yeah you, obviously the there's mighty armies of chaos marching around but in those kinds of stories it's something that just bubbles away and corrupts and corrodes from within and that's what we see here and we've seen that in mm -hmm. some of the other william king stories as well but seeing this this sort of would-be baron who has discovered that his father was fully mutated by chaos and his his own like retainer had kept him in the in the tower and kept him sealed away so that no one would see this mutation. And then that has caused the, the young Manfred Von Deal to kill him and sort of take on this mantle of leading his people. And they've been ousted from their lands as a result of all of this sort of upheaval. But then he is still, even though he's sort of, you know, doing the right thing for, for his people, he still found himself corrupted by chaos, but maybe not, physically in the same way that his father had yeah. been you know sort of it, yes. more in like his yeah and, and so that has just corrupted his mind and led him to think this curse is something that's going to lead to the destruction destruction of these people so he's going to enact it and sort of you know yes bring the curse to life and that's a really super dark version of chaos i think that can destroy almost for manfred von deal it's almost destroyed him without doing anything he sort of hmm thought himself into a corner where he's he's ended up destroying everything um which which is yeah bleak to say the word but yeah yeah it's... it definitely works in this sort of story and i think there's also some fun like red herrings through the tale as well because we we get we're introduced to um frau winter who is a magic user who 
is so Kirsten is the the sort of the damsel in distress that Felix and and really Gotrek save at the start of the story and who Felix starts to have this relationship with. She works for Frau Winter, and Frau Winter is is spends most of the tale sort of as a sort of figure who could be doing some dodgy stuff. And there's a there's the an interaction with uh, sort of uh, skeletal sort of graveyard, a magical boundary, this kind of place where no one should enter because there's some sort of magical seals in place. Overnight, that gets broken, and the caravan get attacked by skeletons. And it sort mm. of feels like, oh, maybe this was her doing. Maybe Frau Winter did this. Um, and then, but she's a very effective red herring for actually. She no, she's totally straight down the line, doing her best. Uses her magic to try and save the people. And really, it's the noble Baron or would be yes. Baron who who is actually the guy who's been corrupted. It's the it's it's not quite a twist, is it? It's kind of you kind of probably know that that's where it's going to go, or something like that. Or well, there's more to it. It's, it would be too simple if it was just her. Um, but y- yes, it is enough kind of different potential arcs that can leave you you're guessing and you're not quite sure about it. And you know that, that at least one of the the followers of this, the Von Deal train that's you know going off towards the border, like border princes, you know that at least one of them's probably not right. And it's about how far deep that, that evil goes, I suppose, isn't it? And uh, mm. and it's it, it's a tragedy at the end. Um that uh, so many of the ones that you think well, maybe they're a bit bad. I don't mean that they don't make it to the end, I suppose, in some ways, but I mean, yeah. it's quite brutal. Even that, even that scene with really the skeletons, brutal, we've yeah. got, we've got orphaned children crying by their dead parents' bodies and things. And there's little sort of quite visceral details, which that would be implied now in, in, in a Warhammer story, probably rather than described maybe. Um, but um, yeah, I, I quite, there's a lot of interesting, likable characters that you could imagine um, being in other stories, and well, I suppose some of them are in some ways, or at least talked about. But it's, um, I, 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 yeah, I love it. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> the fight scene with the over. skeletons was really intense as well. I thought, like, really well done, a very edge of your seat sort of stuff. There's not a load of action in it, but just the setting, the way that the the danger had sort of been seeded earlier feet, on. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's touched upon rather yeah. than just kind of well, everyone fights as normal. It's uh, it's even your heroes are scared and having to fight past fear to be able to 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 sort of just swing a sword. So that's that's yeah. all in there. Yeah, it's great. It's great, and it really feels again like having the the wolf riders themselves and the goblins in there, having skeletons come to life and fight. It, that's a really fun sort of fantasy thing. It really embraces this fantasy world and gives you, okay, here's some some magic stuff, and it's scary, mm-hmm. and it's it's it given a sort of tangibility that's that's really good. Same yeah. with the use of magic. So when Frau Winter defends the fort towards the end of the story, she's using this magic lightning to attack the goblins who are sort of attacking all these green skins who are attacking the fort, and it's really given. A weight it feels powerful and i yeah. quite liked that because it there's always this difficulty in the sort of distinction like how magic is treated in warhammer fantasy roleplay versus warhammer fantasy battle because in the mm-hmm. roleplay game much lower level magic is much sort of rarer and kind of a lower fantasy world through that sort of lens in fantasy battle magic is super powerful and it still it yeah. makes sense because obviously your greatest wizards are marching to war to defend the world or to conquer yeah. it so you can you can sort of square that circle of why it's different but the yeah. what the sort of reverence for that power of magic that's that Godric and felix both seem to have in this story makes it feel like yeah you don't see this sort of stuff every day but there is a time and a yeah, place for it to be used. battle magic or almost yeah. being seen for the first time from people that that won't have been exposed to it got yeah. probably fought in lots of battles Dwarves not really known for their magic, sure. uh, um, or maybe in this era, era they they were actually. But um, and then uh, yeah, Gotrick's never been in the um, Felix has never been in the military, has he? So he's probably not seen those things. He's only heard of those things. So yeah, that kind of magic that would almost fit into Harry Potter in the yeah. sort of practical daily basis kind of things to big fireballs and electric shots and things like that is is different. Yeah, and it's good. It reads it reads very well, and it's quite it dramatic, isn't it? What did you make then of the so the death of Kirsten? So so 
Manfred von Diel in enacting this chaos curse killed everybody yeah. pretty much, including Kirsten, who Felix has now fallen in love with, thought he was going to retire and leave Godric behind for this yeah. woman. She's killed in that. And then it sort of galvanizes Felix to to continue his quest. Like, what were your thoughts on that as a as a device? I, I, I mean, I think it's done as the device for the future of Godric and Felix as, sure. a, as, a, as, a, as a duo, really. Um, and I, so I think it's powerful when you don't have a happy ending in things. Um, and it was, I think Warhammer, le you know, leads to not always having a happy ending, having a slightly kind of, mm, okay, the hero doesn't always fully win. Um, and they win, but it, there's severe costs to their winning um, physically and the, the, the friends and, and people that they, they've lost. And obviously Gotrick loses an eye. So, you know, there's, 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 there's lots goes on there. So, yeah, I think... I'm not surprised that she was killed. I don't think I was surprised. Was I surprised the first time I read it? Too long ago now to remember, <laughs> but I'm not surprised. And I think that it was almost a way of saying, well, this is it now, that they almost cements their duo. Hmm. You know, that was the kind of the the the, the lost eye um, Gotrick completely battered, you know, really, really barely survives the battle. Um, and and then Felix's heart probably doesn't survive the battle and the journey, and and it's almost like that's what hardens them as a duo, and then they go on and have lots of other adventures. But uh, it's um it's quite a, a grim. It's almost like a western when mm. they're they're like like a, a, a train going out to the, the the unknown Midwest, and they're attacked by natives or something, isn't it? The amount of times they're put in danger, they go to different towns and things. So it almost feels like a, a Western where by mm. the end of it, it's a bit of a tragedy and the two gunslingers go off go off their own way because what they kind of joined on to was practically destroyed by the end. I think there's only a few left, isn't there? And they yeah. hopefully, I think it says a bit of a throwaway line, but there's so few of them now, they hope they'll be taken in by another small town and in, in, in the border princess so, but yeah, i think she was it was very much we're going to kill her so you know that felix can't have a relationship yeah you know, he's he's gonna have to he's, yeah he's, his his man wife his man wife which is or dwarf wife is he's got trek and will be for the time being <laughs> but, yeah and it, what about you what did you think well yeah i mean just on that general point about it the sort of western feel yeah i totally agree and it, it really does have that kind of vibe and the border prince is painted as this kind of wild west feels like what they were going for with that aspect of the setting as well so mm -hmm. it really works for that i think the stuff with kirsten i think it as a device it does work and it gets you exactly to where you're saying you know you do get to this place where felix now has realized the sort of happy life isn't going to be possible he's bound to Gotrek and he's bound to this oath and this this sort of quest for redemption. So it definitely works to get them together and, and sort of explain why Felix, who in the previous story maybe wasn't quite as committed to, to Gotrek. He was there because he'd made the oath, but he, he was complaining about it to himself and he, he didn't really seem like he wanted to be there, which I guess will be a continuing theme anyway, but at least yeah. now the resolve makes more sense, I think. Yeah. What I would say, though, is that this is very much of that sort of trope, and you see it quite a lot of um, it's described in comic books as the fridging of of the female character, mm -hmm. the girlfriend character who exists purely to get killed, and then to give yeah. sort of man pain to the hero <laughs> and cause the hero to <laughs> want to get his revenge and go off and do whatever. And it it's been used again and again and again. It was you know terrible in comics for it just lousy with it through the 90s and and, and you know yeah. earlier as well and it still unfortunately does happen so i think it would have been better to get a little bit more of kirsten and sort of understand more about her she doesn't really exist as a character we see more of yeah. frau winter really as a character than of her all we know is how felix feels about her i don't even think we yeah. get a strong sense of her affection for him to be honest, well, you don't. Yeah, he might just <laughs> yeah. be. I, th I, I think there is an element of his character that is he's young and mm. he's inexperienced, and maybe he's thinking with the wrong parts of his body and misunderstanding sure. his his misinterpreting his his feelings and what they really mean. 
Yeah, and, uh, I can completely you know, believe man, that. Yeah. Man, man in my, my mid-40s now, I can remember, remember being in my <laughs> early 20s, which is what I think, I assume that Felix is supposed to be at that age sort of thing. And you, yeah, you definitely think in a different way. And sure. um, I think as the stories progress, again, was his uh, risk of talking about future Gotrick and, and Felix stories, and that might be a lovely discussion one day just to sort of talk about how the, the characters develop. But there are quite a lot more female characters and they're not all throw away kind of um, eye candy for Felix. They, they, there's some pretty strong female characters later in the, in the, in the series that stick around for a lot longer. Um, and they do play on yeah, his romantic sort of feelings and his feelings of love and wanting to settle down. So that's still there. So that those, those are used again, but it's um, I think more here, it was, to move the to mm. define those characters so yeah probably in the way you said but it it doesn't quite set them up for that's it now he's grim yeah. for life and he's never touches you know he, he ignores women he loses his heart he can he's still the same guy but he just gets a little bit sadder and a bit grimmer as 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 he progresses through through the future stories so i yeah. don't think it's you it doesn't turn him into this kind of grim noir um, hero. <laughs> sure. um it's uh it's his character of quite liking the ladies remains um and i'm probably being <laughs> i'm not a sure that's bit... a good thing either in some ways but it's, <laughs> sure. I, I think it was more a device to cement their relationship and, and say right well, well he can't this is he mm. can't disappear off this this duo staying together yeah and, and, and I if think i'm that was it more than to set him up as a, a grim kind of um heartbroken person there's elements of that in the later stories but there's also a lot to suggest that he does get over it as well <laughs> sure yeah i'm probably being a little bit too harsh as well you know i'm obviously yeah. looking with modern sensibilities back at something written mm -hmm. you know in 1989 so yeah it's probably not that fair to to call it out and sort of and leave it there I, it works within it the would have been his children story. that were killed now wouldn't they, they would... <laughs> <laughs> but like it, it does it, I, I think i'm just calling it out it's a bit of a shame i yeah. think i would have liked more in that but it does work and it doesn't undermine the story for me i still really enjoyed this and i think this was probably you know i, I going into wolf riders the collection this yeah. was a strong start much like ignorant armies starting with a william king got and felix story incredibly strong opener and definitely filled me with a lot of excitement for what's to come uh, actually before we move on to what's to come there's a couple of neat little bits of trivia that william king sticks into this story that i should mention one yep. is a name drop of detlef sack uh, yep. from drakenfels which i yep. loved i thought that was great Lo lovely little bit of connective tissue to that and then the other one was that um von deal so the manfred von deal the, the sort of heir to the baronet he is related to Kurt Von Deel, who yeah. was the protagonist in Laughter of the Dark Gods, which was the second William King story from Ignorant Armies, who was a brother who was forced out of his inheritance and he had gone into the Chaos Wastes in order to get enough power to come back and claim his what yes. he thought was his birthright. So it's a great little twist, I think, in the sense that Again, you're seeing chaos, the effects that chaos can have on one family, an extended family, yeah. and how, okay, well, this guy is just completely mutated and turns into a monster, and then this son has to go out into the chaos wastes to seek power and glory so that he can become strong enough to claim what he thinks he wants. And then the other brother is out there doing the quote-unquote right thing, which ultimately ends up in him sort of succumbing yeah. to chaos in a completely different way. And I think that's a, yes. a very, I want to say fun, which is probably not the right sentence to use the word, but it is a very uh, interesting, I guess, exploration of chaos and how brilliant. it can affect yeah. people. Yeah. 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 I, mean, yeah. I agree completely. It's lovely little, <laughs> little tidbits. And, and even though we haven't talked about a lot, Felix is, in, is an educated, educated man who, who writes. And so he, he's already got that connection with mm. playwrights and, and, and that kind of society. So, you know, they talk, the characters talk, don't they? Oh, you're a writer too, and I'm working on a play. And that's, that's all in there as well. So that the, the connections with Detlef works works really well as well. It does. Yeah, it does. And I think actually one of the uh, members of the the, the Patreon uh, discussion that we had about Wolf Riders 
just to explore all the themes and the, the various points of it. So Ryan just mentioned that his sort of summary of this as a story was that this is really where Felix ceases to be the sidekick of Gotrek mm. and becomes the sort of co-protagonist. And I think that's a okay, really good yeah. way of looking at it as a story, because that's very much what this feels like it's doing. It's moving Felix from just a, a tag along character who's there to narrate stuff for us. And the, the real story is about the dwarf to now yeah. going into the next stories I would hope. Yes. Actually, it's these these are both the main character of this tale. Absolutely. And it, it's Gotrek and that, Felix it's, now. It's exactly it. And as the character grows, if you read more, you'll see that it takes a little bit longer for him to realise that. But right. as a reader, we 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 notice that and we realise that. Right. And that's an interesting sort of exploration itself. Yeah. But anyway, we're not we're not we're not doing a There's time for that in the future, book series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The Tylean Rat by Sandy Mitchell. Halfling private investigator Buttermere Sam Warble is retained by a red-haired elf in search of a small rat statue that was stolen from her lodgings. As Sam follows the trail of the missing MacGuffin across the seedy streets of Fogbound Marienburg, it quickly becomes clear that the statue and the people who want it are not quite what they seem. But even the spectre of chaos cults, underworld contacts, dark elf femme fatales, and a good old-fashioned twist in the tale won't stop Sam from completing his case. So this one, set in Marienburg, the tale of a private detective. What were your thoughts on the Talian Rat? I I did enjoy this. It made me it was quite. It amused me first. So I, I should say that I, I didn't manage to get hold of a copy of the book. So I've listened to all of these twice on from the, the wonderful the voice of, of Lewis um, on the, the old Hammer podcast. And I've deliberately not listened to any of his summations at the end because I didn't want them, my own thoughts sort of um, coloured by it. So I'm looking forward to go back and listen to him because he always amuses me. Um, but um so I've listened to everything twice and the first time just listened to it normally, the second time making some some notes as I went along. So I, I really liked it. I think my initial notes um were were this is this is Samwise Ganji meets Columbo. Um <laughs> doesn't quite didn't quite make it into a Poirot kind of character. He's not he's not sophisticated enough. So it's more mm. of a I imagined him more of a, a, a Columbo kind of character. I thought he was unusual. I think the original just the initial descriptions of Marienburg are lovely, really kind of give you a, a feel for Marienburg as a, as a city and the way it works and the, and the, the fog and the mists coming in things. So I thought that was done very, very well. Um, so I think it was well written. Um, there's no surprise with Sandy Mitchell's gone on to write quite a bit more for Black Library in the future. Um, and I thought that the overall tale was absolutely fine for a short story. I think it worked nicely i thought it was amusing in places i thought it was um pace enough and length seemed to be fine as well um yeah i just thought it was fine really i wasn't blown away by it and i can look at it and finally go oh, that was a relatively amusing story and i probably would like to see more of 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 sam warble again because there's enough about him enough of his character that's amusing Maybe you'd always feel like that about half in character, um, but uh, it 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 was good. And there's some characters in it. There's so many kind of detective story type tropes in there that I wasn't offended by. I thought they were quite good. So mm. you've got the 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 guard chief who, you know, if you think of an American private investigator, they always have a contact in the local police force that they get some. <laughs> behind the scenes information on sometimes it's a little bit fractious that 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 relationship between them that's in there with the with, with the, the, the the chief watchman um and you've got um Lisette as well who's clearly sort of linked to the criminal underworld and that happens as well in all of these pi things so he's got his police connection but it'll always have his semi-friendly connection to the to the mafia or something it'll occasionally yeah. give him a tip off or get some extra information it's exactly what you get from these so that i think that you know you could this could have been written by jim butcher um it's it's and i like that because i love his love his books and things so i liked all of that um and would be really interested to see a full-length novel with these characters developed properly or really got a crunchy story all set in, in marienburg and those characters really pushed out a little bit more um you know we've got fairly recognizable chaosy stuff in there as well i think it's 
um, it's from a different side. So you've got the witch elf with you know cane worshipper. I mm. think Slanesh worshipper maybe for the for Erasmus and his little um, snotling. <laughs> but um, I, I liked it. It was good. It was a nice, fun story. It made me chuckle at a few places and, and very recognisable, as I said, as, as some kind of US based private investigator. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fully leaning into noirish fiction. It's it's the Maltese Falcon, but what if we stuck it in to the old mm. world instead, right? And yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think it's a really fun idea and taking all of those tropes, just grabs them all and finds a way to make them work <laughs> in this setting, you know, even down to the femme fatale, except, yeah, she's a witch elf and, and there's this yeah. dark sort of evil stuff going on. I enjoyed it. I really had a good time spending some hours well within the story spending this time in marienburg wandering around going to see contacts trying to sort of follow the leads i think sam was a really fun character and just like playing up that what if halfling was a private detective thing it works surprisingly yeah. well and i agree yes. i'd love to see more stories i mean there is another Sam Warble story to come, which is fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. I had been looking forward to this story a lot because obviously I'm super into Marienburg at the moment. I've been super inspired by it. So knowing that there was going to be a, a story like this in this set, very high hopes. And for the most part, it lived up to it for me. So I had a really good time reading it. I enjoyed it. And I, I still enjoy it, but I do think that it's let down a little bit by its ending and I think this becomes a theme in the rest of this series of stories, unfortunately. But for this one, it was a little bit of a shame. And yeah, maybe this is sort of ties into noirish tropes as well. But it felt like Sam didn't really do anything in the final act of the story. He turns up, he follows the right people to the right places, and he witnesses this battle between both of his antagonists. And then... Not only does Lisette, the sort of underworld contact, turn up, but she turns yeah. up and explains everything that Sam didn't know and then says, yeah. oh, and by the way, the City Watch guy that you're also friends with, he's going to turn up and clean up the mess. So the, yeah. the antagonists defeat each other and then both of his contacts turn up to explain all of the mystery and then yeah. sort of save yeah. the day. And it's not the end of the world, but it just felt like a bit of a sudden a bit too passive an ending for Sam. He didn't, he wasn't responsible for solving anything. And I think that's a bit of a shame for me. Does he, he's almost like he needs some muscle. He needs a, he needs a sidekick that can potentially help him yeah, out in the a... areas where he physically <laughs> can't intervene because it yeah. got to the point in the story where it would be ridiculous if he, he was somehow able to outfight. But then that's any what of I the think bads. in a really strong version of this, ending him using his wits to have yes. outsmarted people or to you know keep them delayed long enough for the city he watch should have prearranged for those other people something to be there like in an that. ambush yeah you know the yeah. the Columbo just one more thing kind of moment where Sam proves why he's good because the sense I get from the story is that Sam is is well regarded as a detective but then the yeah. actual events of the story he gets outsmarted left and right he gets he gets found people yeah, keep finding yeah, him true. wherever he goes he gets conned with the fake gold which he just passes on to his own contacts without even interrogating it and sort of you know it's so all of this stuff happens where he kind of bumbles a little bit too much and again i can let it go because it's just a fun short story it's just a short story yeah but yeah, i would yeah. have loved if he if, if he'd come good by the end of it and, and had actually succeeded at something well, I suppose you could have had this that uh, he, he goes to meet them and the city guard are there and they arrest them and he's challenged, well, how did you know? And then he does the the, the stereotypical end of a PI type thing where you, you he tells how, you know, well, you yeah, he's, this he's worked I realised you were wrong and yeah. explains how he how he got to the bottoms exactly. rather than yeah, it being yeah. told to us earlier on Yeah, um, that he doesn't find out and he goes to meet them and then they get arrested and he explains how he knew what they were up to. Yeah. Um, and that would have been, well, you would have finished the trope off then, wouldn't you? It would have become yeah. um, an Agatha Christie maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but it, and it, maybe it was the point of the story was that, yeah, he's, he's actually not the best detective and it's an absurd <laughs> idea in the first place. 
but it, it didn't quite <laughs> feel like it went far enough to make a sort of parody of those things. Yeah. It felt like it was leaning into it in the in the sort of homage kind of sense rather than the sort of parody sense. Yes. So yeah. for so me, maybe they didn't want to make it too parody. Yeah, it just didn't uh, didn't quite stick the landing, I think. But like I say, I really enjoyed it. There were some really fun details in there as well. Like I said, Marienburg is a really nicely drawn location for this. There's some cool character mm. stuff. There is the Snotling Associate that is just a very odd choice, but fantastic. I love it. Yeah, and it's such a clean Snotling. He's been described <laughs> at one point. <laughs> yeah. It just is a really good, uh, when you put him next to this huge hulking, almost kingpin style bulk of a man, that is the chaos yes. sort of worshipping villain. Like it, just to have a little, tiny little snotling is also, it, it, it's his pal. That's such a fun idea. I'm I'm really behind that. Yeah, yeah, I, I liked it. I'm really looking forward to the next Sam Warble story and see yeah. whether he, uh, see whether he's just hapless and bumbles along in that <laughs> one as well. He's not completely hapless, but he's not he's hapless, definitely but... unremarkable. <laughs> Yeah, he just but knows yeah. some people, doesn't he? That's, that <laughs> seems to be his ability to be a pro private investigator. He knows people, and I, yeah, I look forward to the next one. I know he also turns up in uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay as a as a sort of character archetype as well. I think it's a shame that that seems to be almost the sum total of his appearances because I think it's a fun character. I, I could imagine <laughs> loads of stories with this guy. Yeah, maybe they just didn't know what to do with it because he maybe he can't. Maybe he's not used to the fighting style of stuff. Maybe he's far better suited to, I don't know, track down a copy of Fly Fishing by J.R. Hartley <laughs> rather than <laughs> rather rather than deal with Daughters of Cain. Maybe that's it. Maybe they run run to the end of the road with it. Maybe, it'd be nice to see him turn up in other things. I'd love to see him turn up. Yeah. in God's oh, yeah. Felix novel, which I don't think he, I don't think he does. But but I did enjoy it. It was as a short. And that's it. Every time I thought, well, this is a little bit. And I have to remind myself that this is this is a short story. This is yeah. a standalone as at the time written short story as well. Or, or it's not like it's a, a short in the middle of the vast Taurus Heresy series, Taurus Heresy series, where that short is an important narrative hmm. for the, the wider story. These don't really have much of an impact on, on anything other than what you're reading. Yeah, just the flavour of the world, a little vignette to expand hmm. the Warhammer Fantasy universe. The Phantom of Remy by Brian Craig. A high-class cat burglar has been targeting the upper-class Bretonian city of Remy, committing seemingly impossible yet trivial thefts of small keepsakes and other unimportant items. The town's most famous judge, Voltiger, a well-regarded man of the law who delights the people with his perfectly inventive punishments, directly inspired by the crimes committed, has indirectly become the target of this phantom. He hires armed guards and has his oldest friend and clerk, Malchance, keep watch outside his bedchamber. Still, the Phantom manages to gain access and taunts the judge, but with no evidence of the encounter, even Malchance must question the judge's story. Voltiger is indignant and fires his once great friend, braving the next night alone. But who should reveal themselves as the Phantom but Malchance, seeking revenge for the treatment of a woman he loved but who married the judge? Malchance has framed Voltiger and kills him in a fashion that suggests self-infliction, ensuring that his name will live on in infamy. The perfect punishment. So the Phantom of Remy, this, it's a sort of like a heist, cat burglar story, but it's also a story of revenge and, and a, like a curious tale of a Bretonian city. I mean, what, what were your thoughts on this one, Stu? How did you feel about this? I thought it was very brian craig kind of um i don't i think it was quite nicely written mm. um but again it feels like he's just having some fun within within a few few thousand words really it's, <laughs> I, it's hard i didn't i didn't i'm not i didn't dislike it um it's one of those listen once and or read once and think okay and it was he's got a few enjoyable parts to it Mm. Um, there's a nice little twist in it, which isn't telegraphed too far out. I don't think you can start to guess, but it's not one of those. It's not so obvious that you realize. Ooh, I think I, I challenge you on that one myself. Uh, okay. but we, we can get there. Um, but yeah, I thought it was amusing. There's some interesting names in it. I mean, I don't know. Having listened to it, uh, Monsieur Voltiger is, you know, that's no, just, just a French skirmisher from as far as I'm concerned as a, a, a Napoleon <laughs> fan. Um, there's some interesting bits we talked about. Some of the um, 
punishments um, mm. that he dished out were amusing. I like the uh, some of them are just also just a little bit odd, like the coat of prickly fur to the sort of I can't remember what that was <laughs> like. Really, is that the best you could think of? And I'm talking about the author here rather than the the magistrate's punishment, but I can't, I can't remember what what that was for. But yeah, we're going to punish you by giving you a coat of. It's a bit Monty Python esque. It's like you know the the comfy chair or the soft cushion. It's, it's and then some of them were really really gruesome as well. So it was there's lots of little amusing things like that all the way through it. And I, again, that sort of leads me to think that he's not been particularly serious with the mm. story writing. Um, and using these short stories as a bit of a, a tool to to have fun and tell it almost like a child's tale in some ways. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. definitely, I know what you mean. It's kind of broadly drawn in certain ways. And it's, mm. it is it is someone having fun and just telling a story they fancy telling, it seems like. And it, it doesn't seem too bothered with saying, let's learn more about the Warhammer world. It's kind of just, I've got a bit of a fable or a bit of a, a sort of mm. story of karmic punishment that I'm going to tell. It's a fa- yeah, it's a fable. It's, yeah, it's, it's, and it, yeah. it sort of plays out and, and kind of... I, I enjoyed reading it. I enjoyed the sort of story of it. There's certain allusions to other... Kind of draws on a few other things, even being like the Phantom. You know, there's kind of this mm. sort of Phantom of the Opera, even sort of element of that. And because it leans into the sort of Frenchness of Britonia in certain ways, it brings out a bit of that sort of stuff. I liked this idea of a cat burglar and this kind of, you know, the, the idea of impossible crimes that are happening seemed really fun as a sort of setup. I kind of thought we were going to get a bit of a Jonathan Creek kind of reveal at the end where you find out how this was all done, which as a setup, I was really excited about. Because the the like I say, I enjoyed reading the story. So when we got to the sort of end, I was like, okay, here we go now. How is how is Brian Craig sort of established? He's, he's set up all of this stuff that's happened. Now he's going to explain it, and it's going to be a real wow moment of whether it's magic or whether it's really clever plotting and planning. But it's kind of hand waved a bit at the end, so you yeah. don't get like a a sort of clever reveal. You just get the judge's friend, his old friend, who I think had kind of been a pretty obvious sort of villain from you know he's he can only be one of the two of them and the story is more is going to be more of a sort of interesting well i guess it could have been a more interesting reveal of if it was the judge i suppose but it's malchance his clerk his old friend their love rivals but the the woman that malchance loved had married the judge instead and then the judge didn't treat her well as far as malchance says so he's yeah. then set about enacting this perfect punishment of his own, just like the judge does. But then it, it there was no, like, it wasn't a clever reveal. And I know I've said reveal 20 times, but it just didn't feel like it delivered on that promise to me. And yeah, that's a shame, I, I think. I agree. I think there's a few problems with that. I don't think it made, aside from the magistrate's unusual punishments, they're not always described to be extra harsh either. Some of them are just feels like a a man that's kind of amusing himself, mm. but you don't get the impression beyond that that he's particularly horrible. This I didn't spend enough time yeah. building up any animosity that that um, that um, uh, Monchamp would feel for him. So that again, that's that you could have you could have spent a little bit longer setting the scene there and making him out to be a bad person because so i was left at the end thinking that yeah well voltiger is probably a bit of a but then Montchamp's also a conniving jealous mm. uh, driven mad almost his, his reactions aren't a suitable uh, you know that the jealousy for a, a widow as well the, the wife is long dead as well yeah. still feel you need to um, enact this kind of level of revenge because she chose someone else. It's not even exactly that he was this. tricked out of this. Yeah. And I don't think that they built that at the beginning. I don't think you built up Voltiger to be bad enough to feel like he deserved this. Yeah. Yes, he's not the, the best man in the I world. I completely but God, agree. He's not evil either. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, he's we definitely don't, not evil it... within that kind of setting. Exactly. And what we don't get is any kind of, there's no abuse of power. I mean, you could say, well, some of his punishments are cruel and unusual. 
but they seem to be for guilty people and they seem to mm-hmm. be, you know, everyone agrees that this is a great judge because of these kinds of punishments he comes up with. So yeah. within the like laws and morals of this Bretonian place, he seems to be on the sort of right side of things. And then we've got Malchon, who's, who's kind of like has grown to hate him or, or, you know, despise him over time yeah. because of this love rivalry. But all we're told about that is that the woman that Marchand's loved chose Voltiger of her own volition, and we're never told that Voltiger did anything bad to her. They had yeah. five kids or whatever it was, and she lived presumably a happy life because he was very wealthy, which is what she wanted, it seems. So there's probably a really interesting story there of actually well, what happens to someone who feels that level of jealousy, which then turns to hating this old friend which then maybe turns to you know being seduced by chaos and using chaos to do all of these kind of crazy crimes and enact this crazy punishment well yeah. actually we don't get any of that we just get Marchand thinks he's right and he gets away yeah. with it and he didn't even use chaos or magic really he sort Not of really know no, he played. just kind of did it somehow which yeah. which kind of doesn't really explain how he got away with so exactly of it. the yeah, things he was doing in that room would have made quite a bit of noise i mean how did he force the hinges off a locked box yeah and he, at exactly. the end he, of he, someone's he, bed i mean <laughs> he explains it and he just says and that's how he literally is just like you know i, I came in quickly and then that's how i was able to get in the room quickly it's like this doesn't really explain this at it's, all so yeah i feel like there was a missed opportunity to either and I know I'm sort of saying I want this and I'm not judging a story based on what the ju- the story is, but it feels like it walks up to the precipice of being this very cool sort of Jonathan Creakian style mystery or yeah. an exploration of what chaos can allow you to do if you are this kind of jealous person. Which, which and instead, it it's neither of those. It just sort of ends. And this, it kind of starts to cement, like with the Italian rat, it starts to cement this unfortunate trend in the rest of these stories of just going and then it ended <laughs> that'll do because it's a short <laughs> yeah. story you know what would you and considering craig's kind of penchant for slanesh he could have very easily worked that into the the the, the, the solution for for the way um uh, uh Monchon was was behaving and it would have been fitted perfectly into it and made no huge difference to the story not and as well as making it more warhammer yeah I agree. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it definitely didn't quite deliver what I wanted. Tommy in the Patreon discussion described it as having a sort of Poe esque quality, uh, an mm-hmm. Edgar Allan Poe sort of mystery story. And I think there's a certain amount of that. There's a certain amount of nice writing in it. And I, I did enjoy reading it. So I don't want to say I didn't like the story overall. It just feels yeah. like it sort of racked up too many missed opportunities for me yeah. to be a real success as a story you could, yeah you could have there's not many other characters in it and when they are in it they're kind of so much on the periphery i'm not sure they were needed i'm not sure you needed the the wizard that was there to help him protect the home oh, i quite like um, that wizard he, actually because it, that i mean i made me of... laugh because all he shouted was alarm alarm all the time yes after things yeah. have happened it, it's almost a bit like he should have been an extra in a lower low you mentioned the, <laughs> <laughs> kind of kind of, the flashing knobs the flashing knobs it's, it's just then... it's, or dan's army or something i just got this impression of this elderly wizard that's half with it that was kind of waking up as, as things had already happened. I don't, I don't think it was supposed to be comedy, but it made me chuckle. But I think that um, did work because that again reminded me of like a a, a role playing game scenario yeah. where you'd have that kind of character who turns up. So I'm I'm all for that sort of. Well, it was the only magic in it, really. Though, yeah, wasn't it? exactly. It was almost a way well, of making yeah. it making it warhammer and not not 15th 16th French century France <laughs> yeah which yeah. you know and I don't want to say that there's no space to tell a story that doesn't have magic and doesn't have chaos and is just a you know a more a sort of simpler lower level story within the Warhammer world I yeah. absolutely think that there is space for that it just has to be really good if you're going to yeah. do that if you're going to choose to do that in this world where you've got so many tools that you could pick up and use and you choose not mm. to then you better be delivering something that's really special, I would say. Yeah, I think that point, but as an overall editorial piece about a whole book of short stories, 
if they're all doing that, as we'll come on to, sure, it, that's where it's noticeable more because there's nothing wrong with having a story that's, that's very low fantasy within a collection of others that show other areas of the world, but they seem to show very familiar mm. areas of the same parts of the world that, that don't really seem to be the main part of the world that we're all playing in and war gaming in. I think, and that's why it's, it's yeah. also strange. Yeah, and well, whilst we're on that, there's an interesting point here, just around like you said about Brian Craig sort of has his particular favorites, Slanesh, and he likes to mm. set stories in Bretonia. We do see a, a, a few stories or that reference Bretonian characters or locations or a set there. And it is interesting how that for a long time wouldn't really be a focus for Warhammer as a, as a game, either role play or, or battle game. So it is, it's interesting that, I mean, maybe, the brief sort of was people saying, well, I'm going to go and explore somewhere that I'm not treading on any toes. But mm -hmm. then we've seen from like what William King is writing, that it's totally possible to be right in the heart of certain corners of the old world and tell really good stories that draw on things that are happening without treading on any toes and actually just enhancing everything else. So it does feel like, why did so many of these authors choose or were told or however it came about go off and say, well, I'm actually going to set this story somewhere where it's not going to bother anyone and add nothing. I think it's just down to knowledge and, and really getting the, Maybe, the yeah. universe that they're writing in. And, and if you're writing in a, you read, you've got a copy of Warhammer fantasy role play and you can imagine medieval France. <laughs> you're It's a lot easier than kind of doing the extra research or really get into a, mm. a, a and, and having to invent more because you don't have to invent much when you're just writing writing from that historical yeah that's true that's why it all seems to be that or or germany doesn't it it's which is fine i don't mind that i quite like those parts of the old world but it's if you're writing from you know from a, a, a perspective of not really knowing those worlds as well as some other people you can get away with it yeah yeah it's a fair point one other device that i think is an interesting one of note with Brian Craig's stories, at least, is they seem to start, a lot of his shorts start as, there's a storyteller telling a tale, and mm -hmm. this is the story that they tell. And there was a good discussion that we had in the in the, uh, in the the live chat where it was like, is this the story or one of the stories that Orfeo tells? So the minstrel character from Brian Craig's uh, okay. trilogy of stories, uh, he is a storyteller. We're told he goes around and he tells stories all over the world. Both Brian Craig shorts in this collection start with a storyteller telling a story, never explicitly says it's Orfeo or, or really even hints that it is, but it could yeah. be. And that, yeah. I it think, is a nice, nice did idea. Yeah. It was. <laughs> I think it would have been nice, yeah, if it, it instead of a storyteller tells this story, if it's Orfeo sits you down to tell you one of the tales mm -hmm. of whatever. Quite like that. Would have been quite cool, yeah. But then that does open the door, unfortunately, to the fact that at least I personally think the stories that were alluded to in the Orfeo book in Zaragoz, where it says Orfeo told this really cool story about knights on quests with magical items and curses and all this sort of stuff sounded really fascinating. And then there's a couple of others like that that sound really interesting. Why did Brian Craig not tell those stories? <laughs> like they, they sound like they'd be really fun Warhammer tales. So mm. I don't know why he's chosen to tell this one and there's another story coming up when he could have told another like Orfeo related story that would have been more fun perhaps I suppose one is just a description of what the story may be about yeah <laughs> and, and it's, it isn't a story it's just a, a couple of lines describing a story whereas this actually means you've got to write the story and it's a lot <laughs> easier to do that when you've only read the Warhammer fantasy role play and uh yeah, I guess as well, you're right. It's it's easier to just say, and then Orfeo told a story that was amazing <laughs> than actually write the amazing story that Orfeo told. It was so. epic. You heard Lord of the Rings well. This is <laughs> <laughs> Cry of the Beast by Ralph T. Castle. Thomas lives with his halfling guardian Brody in a beach hut somewhere in Estalia, 
At night, there are sometimes weird sounds, but Brody insists it's nothing. One night, a half-drowned, stricken elf maiden washes ashore, and Thomas feels the fires of attraction for this new guest. In the night, the elf is drawn to an illusion of her lost brother before being dragged away by a hideous monster. Before Thomas can pursue the beast, Brody finally tells him the story of his father, an innocent man whose wife was taken by chaos, and who became consumed by vengeance, a quest that cost him his life. Despite Brody's warnings, Thomas tries to save the elf, but he is too late, discovering only her remains. A great fight with the Chaos Beast ensues, this champion of chaos only just bested by Thomas thanks to a handy dash of luck. And then, Thomas finds a necklace that reveals the truth of this beast. It was his father all along, or at least what his father had become. Cry of the Beast, this mm. was the only story written by one Ralph T. Castle. As far as I can tell, the only story written by Ralph T. Castle of any type in any book ever. <laughs> so this person only wrote one short story for GW Books. Um, so whether or not it was a pseudonym or not, I don't know. Might have just been someone who submitted a story or what have you. But this one, I, I, I'm going to tip my hand very early. <laughs> I, there's something about this story that really frustrated me. And I didn't, mm -hmm. I, I, it just didn't come together for me, this one. And I, I think because it's so simplistic and also so full of like contrivance and convenience in the sort of storytelling yeah. space that it is just not satisfying at all. I mean, how, how did you find Cry I, of the Beast? I, I agree. It, it's, it's not very well written at all. It feels like the kind of thing I could, I don't write. And it feels like the kind of thing, at least story that I might, come up with is not it is it's not the most in depth it's it, so much wrong with it to be honest the, the names make <laughs> no sense whatsoever isn't it supposed to be set in Talia we've got Thomas Brody Brody the halfling it's this there's there's lots that that don't make any any sense about it even the name of of um Thomas's father which we learn mm. about later in the story is a Richard Crowell, isn't it? Something like that's I mean the famous yes. Italian esque <laughs> <laughs> name. Um, it's it, it's it feels I don't want to call it lazy. I just it just feels very fan fiction esque esque, mm. um, and there's not a lot to it. It's very linear. You can kind of guess what's going to happen. Points. Yeah. Um, and it has some, you know, it has some promise at the beginning. It's the noise outside that Thomas wakes to and it's a haunting noise and he's told not to go. So, so it builds something that could be a horror. And maybe it's the kind of thing that would play better as a um a late night horror short somewhere, mm. sort of like um and, and maybe, maybe that's what it is. What's that series of US horror shorts called? What are mind blank now? Boom, 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 boom. No, I'm not gonna remember it, so we'll move on. Um but the, it feels <laughs> like the kind of thing that I would have watched on telly um as a half half an hour program as a as a teenager. Uh, sure, on, like on an Channel outer limits or a Twilight Zone or Twilight Zone, that's sure. what I was thinking of. So it feels like that kind of level of story that would have been on at 2 a.m. on a on a on a Saturday night when I was when I was a kid or something. But yeah. It, it's it, it's that kind of level. It almost it's, you could see how that as an outline for a story would work better as something on the screen rather than as a piece of writing where you've got more space to actually, you know, describe more, go a little bit more into the characters. I just it's very hard to sort of really talk about it because it's all so plain and straightforward. I suppose. Yeah, it's a bit. There's, there's more... not much depth to anything. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. It feels, and I, I you know, I don't want again. I don't think it was lazy. It feels maybe it might have been a bit rushed, perhaps, mm -hmm. or didn't have, you know, the the additional drafts and the sort of tightening up of a story that you might want. I mean, theoretically, this tale of a young boy who's been raised by a halfling who encounters this elf maiden whose ship has been uh, shipwrecked and there's then a chaos beast that's pursuing them and there's also this tied in story of the the young boy's origins and how his father has been sort of lost to chaos but has returned now even unknowingly sort of you know is and sort of was watching over him as a chaos creature now so there's there's yeah. kind of 
okay, that that could be a cool story, I guess, if if written in an interesting way. But I don't it feel like it comes together. It feels like um, it feels like the backstory for an RPG character that uh, a teenager oh, yes. might come up with. Yeah, you know, I'm a 15 year old lad. I want to make my. I'll make him 18 because because obviously I'm looking forward to when I'm 18 and I want to be a <laughs> bigger man. Raised by I like halflings. They're funny. I was raised by halfling and uh, quite like an elf to come and visit me. <laughs> you know, and it's and there is that element of it as well, isn't there? When he's attracted to um, Lena, and it just again it feels like a backstory that someone might write for their for their warrior human RPG yeah. character. It I'm does, like, and and I think. Story. Not the only story in this collection that has a similar, the, the, the sort of ending is, and now the big quest begins. So this mm. this is like the, the prelude to a good story. So yeah. this is a half-baked, if you, know, if you want to use that sort of cruel language, half-baked backstory to the really interesting tale, but you're not going to get the interesting tale because we're focusing on this bit. And in, yeah. in, there's not enough here outside of those those sort of sketchy th- this happened and this happened and this happened kind of bullet points the, there isn't enough meat to these to sort of on these bones to make it really worthwhile the 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 brody character the halfling i i quite liked I, you know everyone loves a, a good halfling i think brody i wonder if that's a reference to the character from jaws maybe you know, we're, um, we're at yeah. the seaside, sort of this town. You know, there's a certain amount of that, don't go in the water kind of vibe to him. So I, I, that was my read on why he's got that name. But there's not really much more of like the, the Chief Brody character in, in this. And then Thomas is a total blank slate. There's nothing to him at yeah. all. Same with Lena, really, the elf. Yeah. And then the actual reveal on the sort of twist on the chaos monster oh, actually, the chaos monster is your father, and we know this because he's got a the same Dawnstone that Brody's just given you and just told you about. Well, first of all, like structurally, we only find out the truth of the the lost father character like a few lines, a paragraph yeah. or two before the reveal, it feels like. So it's not like it's this long-held mystery that we then have a satisfying conclusion to. It's just a sudden, oh, and by the way, this is the case. And then there's also a real lack of sort of interrogation of what it means that this chaos monster, which has somehow found its way all the way from the chaos wastes to here to be close to his son, and but still want to kill him, it seems. Yeah. There's, but doesn't just no storm. There. You, well, could have, no, you could have gone to town on, on there's so much stuff Luke, you could have done I am for your sure. Father could have, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the, so this chaos beast is right there, lives in a cave right next to Thomas. For no reason, it doesn't just storm through the shack and kill Brody yeah. and kill Thomas any night. If it's out there making noises every night, it could just come and kill them. But it doesn't, and there must be a reason for that. And it doesn't. We don't explore that, and we also don't get the any kind of moral sort of exploration of well, the father lost his wife to chaos and then vowed vengeance. And that revenge cost him his life as well, because he then became chaos. Didn't get to raise his son. Didn't get to see what he became. He he sacrificed everything and ended up a chaos monster, a sort of father in the shadows chaos monster. And then the son makes exactly the same vow of revenge. I've yeah. lost my father to chaos now, so I'm going to get revenge. And Brody doesn't go, but that's what your dad did, and he lost everything. Brody's just like. I'll get my axe or whatever he says. Yeah. It kind of ends on this triumphant now the quest begins kind of thing when actually the, the real ending here should be this is a terrible damnation that you are walking towards. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it wasn't that long before in the story that Brody was saying, we can't win this. Yeah. We need to get away now. Let's get in the boat. We will just sail yeah. miles away. But it makes you wonder why. Why didn't you do that when... <laughs> When he was a baby, when he first came back, why be so close? You know, I always knew he'd come back looking for us. Well, it's <laughs> why did we stay here for? <laughs> you, this place you want to take us now safely? We could have been. You could have brought me up there. You said it was nicer weather. You said it was better. We could have moved. And it's kind of like, oh, I really should have. She really shouldn't have stayed here. It's like mm. I really shouldn't have. <laughs> it just it doesn't make 
And he's like, well, I really shouldn't have bought this house next to this, that nuclear reactor that, that split 20 years ago. <laughs> now all my hair's falling out. It's got, I think, oh, we should move away now. My hair, all my hair's gone. And now yours is going. It's, got, <laughs> it's, it's, it's odd. It's odd. Yeah. yeah. The old Hammer Fiction podcast that you mentioned before, Lewis on that did a little bit of analysis after reading the story. And I completely agree with it. He talks about the fact that Lena, the elf maiden, she has lost her brother. She thinks her brother might be alive. So there's been a shipwreck. She and her brother were both lost at sea. She's made her way to the shack with Thomas and Brody, but she's like desperate to find her brother. And that then leads her into the arms of the, the, the monster. But the brother is given a bit more backstory. He's like an alcoholic, gambling, elf kind of like rogue character. Sounds super interesting. And he's not in the story at all. So he's just introduced as a concept of a really interesting character who you're never going to get to meet and has no it's bearing on anything. interest in any of the characters that are yeah, actually exactly. in the Yeah, exactly. That's what Lewis says. <laughs> it, it, I want to spend time with that character and we don't get to. We have to spend time with Thomas, the boring guy. And I yeah. completely agree. It's, it's an odd choice. It is odd, isn't it? It is <laughs> yeah. odd. Like, you say, like, it, like you're saying, it kind of feels like he's set. It's like it's like he, he's put the manuscript in and gone, that's it. They're going to ask for a full novel on the back of it. <laughs> on, the, on the story, it's going to be like, we've got Gottrick and Felix, well, we're going to have Thomas and Brody. Um, <laughs> and it's going to be brilliant. And uh, What yeah, a different I, world I it would be if there were 20 volumes. get that phone call. <laughs> No, he didn't. <laughs> Ralph T. Castle did not get that phone call. He changed his name to Roy and went and filmed Record Breakers. Or um, but um, another another eighties reference for you in this. Uh, um, it's yeah, I, it's probably the worst actually out of all of them. In in many there's, there's there's some of them have been questionable. I've had more redeeming factors, but there's there's not a lot to to, to really kind of like in a re redeeming sense i think it's a really harsh thing to say but it's it's, it's lacking in so many ways um, yeah and some of the things you could have done to improve you so it was you you wrote it some of the things <laughs> that could have been done to improve it um were relatively simple as well yeah and i I'd say so this one for me ties for the worst slot uh and and the reason i don't know that i think this one is the worst is because it's mercifully short so it, mm. it wasn't as long as my other uh, you yes. know, lowest ranked story, which we'll come to in time. <laughs> we'll get to it. But yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't enjoy this. I thought it was just it was just too frustrating a story for me because it didn't deliver on any of its promise. I think there's some cool ideas. Brody's a cool enough character. Slanesh Chaos Monstrosities, that's cool. There's just not enough to make it work for me. Yeah, agreed. No Gold in the Grey Mountains by Jack Yeovil. Brigands hold up the carriage of a young girl, kidnap her and take refuge overnight in the abandoned castle Drakenfels. Abroad in the dark, there is a dangerous old lady, a withered vampiric hag that begins cutting the brigands down one by one, entering their minds, dismembering their bodies and drinking their blood. By morning, all of the highwaymen are dead, and the young girl and old hag are revealed to be one and the same. This witchy woman is a psychic manifestation of the girl, who is in reality a vampire of unknowable age. No gold in the Grey Mountains. So this is the Jack Yeovil story. So Kim Newman writing as mm -hmm. Jack Yeovil. This is our sort of prequel to Drakenfels. Yes. So we, we're getting places and characters, in some cases, that we've seen before in Drakenfels. What were your thoughts on this as a story? Um, I really like this. Um, it's very simple. Um, we talked about if we can compare with the last story as a as a as a very short, relatively short, simple horror story. Um, this does it right, um, and happen everything happens fairly quickly. Gets on with it, and people die. And at the end, you 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 know you've you guessed what's going on earlier on, but at the end, you 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 look at this character, this this incredibly old vampire that's also a little girl that you recognise if you've you know read other stories and think that was good it was nice it was enjoyable and it's gruesome in places i quite like some of the uh the the, the characters as well so but it, it it's it works i think it was a bit of a lesson in how you can write a short horror story and 
it work and you, and you build the suspense and you can imagine it again imagine this as a as a, as a better um <laughs> short tv program rather than one of the more shocking ones but um I, yeah i liked it I liked it a lot <laughs> yeah because i think if if dragon fells was something like an interview with the vampire meets shakespeare in love meets i don't know game of thrones this yeah. is is interview with the vampire meets alien Yes, uh, and yeah. meets American Horror Story, maybe. So it, it very yeah. much, it is. It is short. It is sweet in in its mm-hmm. sort of delivery. Very efficient. It's just pure slasher kind of horror. Yeah. In in and it's for me a huge triumph. I love this. This mm-hmm. was the best story in this collection for me. It was a, everything I wanted from a prequel to what so far has been my favourite of the stories, the Drakenfels book. We return to Drakenfels the place, but we don't spoil the character. He's still as menacing and looming a figure as ever, even though yep. he's not in this at all. But he's he is in it because this is a place of evil and we're going to see some evil here. And that evil is just is drawn in such an interesting, fun way to have this, this this creature this this sort of hag vampire whatever it is wandering around just wreaking vengeance on these brigands who have kidnapped the the young girl yeah. in quite inventive and dark ways very much a horror movie you can see that kim newman horror movie stuff coming through very powerful stuff some really fun inventive moments but again, like in Drakenfels, I thought all the characters were given enough character, for want of a better word. They actually have their own motivations. They have their own interests and their own hates and desires and, and wants and all that sort of stuff. There is friction amongst them, and it makes sense. And we're given the sort of internal monologues of them all. So we understand what their position is on all these different things that are going on. And that's the best kind of horror film. A, a lot of sort of horror stories, I think, get it wrong because they're too willing to create a load of characters who are two-dimensional, who are just names, yeah. who can be in a room to get killed, and that's it. What yeah. Kim Newman does here is give you characters who are characters, proper characters, who you can then sort of either you like or you dislike or you want them to die or you want them to live. You're mm-hmm. actually... The main character, Joe Lamprecht, he, I wanted him to make it through by the end. He's a bad guy. All mm. Throughout the whole story, we're told he's a bad guy. Everything he's done is bad. He's kidnapped this 13-year-old girl, this noble girl, because he wants to ransom her off. He's been leading these, these guys, outlaws, for however long. But I still wanted him to win because he's, He's very capable, he's quite calm, and he's doing bad stuff, but he's he's like impressively doing that bad stuff, if that makes sense. It reminded me a bit of, and I I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but in No Country for Old Men, where you've got a character who is who's doing the right things. He's doing everything you should do in this situation, and you want him to win. I I felt. Uh, Yeah. And yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I think, a real win for a for a very short story. Yes. He really got me on side. I, I wanted him to make it through the night. It's hard to put you. You listening to you talk about the the caring about the characters and and, and in terms of words spoken about them and describing them, there's not there's not a lot there. And if you compare it to you know, the previous story, maybe mm. even less words in some ways that and less backstory that we learn about the previous characters. But it's done in just the right amount that you learn what you need to know about those characters yeah and and you know enough to get a picture uh, of the the dynamic between the four of them and and who does what and who yeah. do you feel sorry for do you feel sorry for the younger lad or do you feel sorry for the 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 the, the half width lumbering i mean they're all their tropes aren't they but uh, oh yeah but 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 it works and you maybe it's because they are tropes but they're tropes in a in a very clever way so you you don't need to write too much about them for us to go 
I recognize who that character would be in a million other programs or, or books or, or, or things mm. I've seen. So you, you find them instantly recognizable as, as the kind of characters will be in those situations. And yes, they're rogues, but that's the thing, isn't it? They're not very nice people, but in this setting, you can like a rogue and it's not a nice world as it is anyway. And some people just do what they have to. Um, and you feel that within their own little, their own little sphere of influence that they're just getting on with what they mm. know best. And, um, and I think, you know, they're in trouble, you know, there's something sinister. Oh yeah. Early on. So you start, you start worrying for them. I mean, she's, she's delightfully disconcerting right from the, the first moment when they've opened the carriage door and she's like, hello. You know, it's kind of, <laughs> hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, um, yeah it's just i think and i think it just shows the quality of the, the writing hmm. compared to some other other things that in in i don't know how many words difference but he's able to deliver all of that um and yeah you can imagine it as a as a film can't you you can imagine it as oh, a short yeah. story yeah, i can imagine it on the screen i suppose and that's very similar i suppose you we said that when we, we talked through jack and Fells, that the initial scene it felt like a, a film and, and again this feels like the beginning of a of a horror film it set, does it is set in this in a in those kind of periods it's just it's, it's great really good yeah i totally agree and it yeah it really did like i say bring to life or, or had that sort of feel of alien to me yeah this unstoppable horror that's stalking these corridors and these guys are just going to try and do their best for as long as they can to survive i mean you've got rot wang who incredible name who's just a bit of a scumbag and he's kind of out for himself. And you've then got these other characters and they all sort of interact in really fun ways and interesting ways. And yeah, it is really tropey. It's very much drawing from all of the tropes Mm. you'd see in any kind of classic horror film of this type, but it does it really well and it does it interestingly. Mm. And then there's some really, really good scenes as well. So when I think it's Grot Shiel, the youngest of the, the brigands. Yeah, Grotteshello, is it? Grotteshello, yeah. He gets, his mind is totally broken by this sort of vampiric force and he just runs off into the dark corridors of, of Castle Dragonvales, which we already know because we've read Dragonvales. We know how dangerous and scary that is. And then Lamprecht goes after him. He, he doesn't even know why he's doing it and that's great. He's like, I didn't think I cared this much about this guy, but maybe I do or maybe I don't. And I've been, to- <laughs> you know, my mind has been corrupted by this uh, force so he goes out into the darkness and there's just a really good scene that you can totally visualize he comes to the end of the corridor he finds the young um, highwayman just right there and then he sort of turns around and reveals that actually he's been totally taken over and is possessed and they then have a very well written fight in the darkness and actually joe gets injured and only just survives and then he's stumbling back through the darkness and he ends up having to fight uh, Rotwang as well, who's then turned yeah. into a werewolf through this sort of dark powers, and it, it just the the fight scenes really work mm. for me. They're just so well written, and the and the each wound that Joe seems to take just again and again and again is he's just really feeling it. And then there's also a really nicely done sort of Chekhov's gun of the introduction of the spur that Joe has left mm-hmm. on his boots from when they yes. rode in. And he accidentally he slices his hand on it earlier in the story when he puts his boot on in a rush. It's like, oh, I need to remember to take that off. And then that comes in handy later on because he's now fighting a werewolf. So yeah. that's just nicely and, deployed. It works really yes. well. And yeah, and again, that's another I keep using it as an as a comparison, but that wouldn't have been done in the in, in, in some of the other stories. No. He'd have just gone, oh, I, by the way, I happen to have this <laughs> silver dagger. Yeah. And it would have been a lot more in your face and like, oh, okay, this was cleverly done. And you choose the clever. same thing with the same amount of, of words as well. Hmm. But it's, yeah, smart storytelling. Yeah, I totally agree. And then, of course, the reveal at the end that the vampire, this whatever creature it was, is actually some sort of magical manifestation of the yeah. girl. They're one and the same thing. And she's just been tormenting these guys for fun because she wanted yeah. to have, have some fun. Do you think she's the young girl vampire we meet in the convent or not? Yeah, so I did go back and double check just to, to make sure it all lines up. And yeah, it, it is. So That was my assumption. It, yeah, Lady Melissa Dac, or however yeah. you pronounce it. So it is the same granny 
vampire yeah. for <laughs> the vampire Genevieve. There's a slight, I think there maybe is a tweak to the character. She's not, she doesn't feel quite the same because she's a mm. lot more of a sort of grandmother kind of character in. She's almost convent. retired there, aren't they? In the convent, that's where they yeah, and, it, and maybe it's ten or twenty. I think it probably would be something like ten or twenty years later. So you could, yeah, maybe she mellowed out, and this was her final hurrah, as it was. She's were. also, you know, not totally dead, is she? She's one of the no, she's not similar, similar style to, to yeah. They're Genevieve, not truly so. dead. I think they they yeah. talk about it, yeah. But yeah, so it and it does make sense. It works. There's enough continuity there for it to to play well, and that's your sort of prequel element or. Is really a middle quill, whatever that mm. term would be, because it takes place after the prologue to Drakenfels, but before yeah. the meat of the Drakenfels book. And this is what she was up to before she went to the convent and spent yes. 20 years with Genevieve. So yeah, it, it, it works really, really nicely. It's it's a fun that's and that's why I like it as a prequel, because I think the best prequels tell you something else about the world without mm -hmm. sort of spending a load of time saying let's find out where Drakenfell's got his helmet from, you know, and like all of these details you don't need to spend a whole story on. This yeah. is actually something that adds some flavor to the world instead of just regurgitating the same stuff. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So yes, I am very much looking forward to more Kim Newman, Jack Yeovil stories. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, we've thankfully got a few more in the Genevieve, series and we've also got some of his dark future stuff as well future stuff mm. so i'm really super excited as much as i've enjoyed the gotrek and felix and the the william king stories kim newman's work is definitely my mvp of gw books mm -hmm. so far absolutely adore it we'll definitely be reading some of his other work as well uh, in the future because yeah. it's just fantastic agreed definitely we need them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're definitely bringing up the average from the the, the overall series for sure. Yeah, <laughs> the Hammer of the Stars by Pete Garrett. A caravan of barbarian travelers arrive at the city of Wurtbad. If allowed, they would join the festivities in the upcoming festival of Tal and Ulrich. The barbarians, though looked down upon by the people of the city, put on a triumphant show in honor of their god and they are invited to dine with the great and the good. They take this opportunity to drug the people of Wurtbad and descend into the ruined hallways beneath it in search of the runes that would point the way to the Hammer of the Stars, a great artifact of power that they would use in their fight against chaos, but which currently powers the defences of Wurtbad. Only a handful of young would-be heroes stand in their way. Hammer of the Stars, Pete Garrett's short story. This one... I think it's got some interesting ideas, but I'm, I question some of its execution. <laughs> where, where did you fall on on Hammer of the Stars? Uh, it was it was back down to earth, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> I didn't enjoy this very much at all. It's with you, um, for it, 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 different to different to the, the 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 previous one we did, didn't like very much. Um, this wasn't necessarily badly as badly written in some ways, but I just. I, I didn't really like the, the idea of the story at all. Really, it wasn't, it wasn't very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure that it handled any of it that maybe the way that it was intended. I don't. It's very hard to. I was thinking about this one today. I'm thinking, what am I going to say about it? I just find that it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, we don't know much. The <clears throat> barbarian travelers are. You know, I don't know who they are or where they really can't imagine where they come from in the in the setting so mm. it seems a little bit vague um and I, I yeah just lots of i don't know if you, the, the kid the main characters the kids don't really have enough depth to them it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense yeah um i don't know i was a little bit lost with there was a lot of why <laughs> my this. issue with this one is that it feels to me like it sort of glides past the most interesting aspect of its own story. So we've got these barbarians who turn up at a sort of traditional city in, mm. I'm not sure if it was the Empire, if it was Britonia, Wurtbad, I, I think it's the city, right? I think it's an Empire. I imagine it sounds, empire, it, it sounds empire, like that, yeah. right? Um, so they turn up at this Empire city 
and there's a real sort of class divide, I think. So you get mm. the people of the city looking down on these sort of traveling barbarians and, and sort of they don't want to let them in. They don't like them. They, there's a lot of it's sort of, sort of class warfare going on here. And then ultimately, by the time you get to the end of the story, you find out that these barbarians have come to steal a magical artifact that the city has and the city uses to defend itself. Yeah, They want to use it, the barbarians, to fight chaos. And their point is, you are being selfish, keeping this magical weapon for yourselves, when we would take it to the front lines to try and fight chaos and save everybody. And yeah. I think that that is a very interesting story because you've got the reveal on the fact that the barbarians, the travelers, who everyone's looking down on, are actually the selfless people. We thought yeah. they were there to steal precious stuff for themselves from these noble city dwellers, when actually the noble city dwellers are just hoarding protection mm -hmm. for themselves. Yeah. And the barbarians are the true heroes. And I think that that is a very interesting setup could be a really interesting story but this version of this story just wants to say and that's why the barbarians are bad because they're thieves they break yeah. the law and laws are automatically good because they're laws and that's kind yes. of not an interesting story i don't think no i don't exactly what you described would have been a good story and it doesn't tell that story no Nobody it's in there bri super briefly but it's just not explored no, it's not, and, and and you could tell that story with without the, the characters. I think the the, the two mm. the young characters of, um, well, I can't even pronounce. Oh, so this is why I've written names down from hearing them. But it's <laughs> Peridua, 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 I Peridua think and Saskia Whiteflower. Um, yeah, Saskia Whiteflower. What awful, strange sort of name. And they their their characters seem to be a little bit mixed up as well. About um one one lost his father who was a knight she's an orphan but they're both in fairly wealthy families so it feels mm. like you've kind of mixed what would be a backstory about one character and maybe spread it across the two of them whereas normally you'd have one in a more traditional family sense and in that so it, it feels like they spend too much time telling that it just didn't really wasn't really needed in some ways um and i think it would have been better telling the story from the perspective of um the leaders of the town and and, mm. and the, the chief of the guard or something like that to be able to tell the story about the the politics around you should they let them have this yeah um maybe if they'd asked for it in the first place or been been asked you know we would like to use this to help protect you and then when they were turned down they then then it was the subterfuge and the train stealing mm. i'm not sure that the kids being part of the, the, the the well, the tale kids... to, and they kind of save the day, but not save the day at the end. Anyway, yeah. it's all a bit, bit of a wet ending, wasn't it? Really, I mean, he's a Dawnstone as well. We didn't mention that, isn't it? Wasn't it a Dawnstone that Brody had that he it gave was, to? Yeah. Who, um, <laughs> again, is it? I haven't, I can't, I'm not going to reach my Warhammer roleplay, but is Dawnstone one of the magical items in Warhammer Fantasy roleplay by chance? Because, well, um, there's the Doomstones are the sort of big the second big campaign they did i mean dawnstone i don't remember off the top of my head but it feels very like it would be a magical item yeah around right but yeah i think this has pcs from someone's role-playing group in it and i think that's part of the reason why the backstories feel so muddy is again because they're mm. a bit like okay well my character is an orphan and that's why they're going to go on all the adventures and they're both very smart and the top of their class but also they're one of the best squires and and would-be knights and you know yeah. so like they've just taken every single box for the wish fulfillment of the reader i guess because they're going to yeah. go off on a quest and this is the other one i was talking about when i mentioned for the end of cry of the beast when it it sort of it's the least interesting part of a story as a prelude to a, a more interesting epic adventure and we never get the epic adventure. We just get the boring start because yes. we have these. We end this story with Peridur and Saskia and Brother Martin, who's sort of a, a, a wiser character, stood ready to take on the quest to find the hammer of the stars. You know, come yeah. back next week and you're going to see our heroes on their adventure, but they never do yeah. go on that adventure. And yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. You're right when you say that the, you know these characters they didn't 
really need to be in this story. The reason they are in this story is because they get to foil the bad guys. And the reason they foil the bad guys is they sort of out talk them. In, they sort of prove that they were wrong. So the, the, the bad guys just leave. <laughs> it just sort yeah. of doesn't really work. Feels like an early scene in a Dungeons and Dragons movie, maybe. And then, then yeah, to, yeah. I mean, with the name like Saskia Whiteflower as well. That that's D and D. That's not that's not even Warhammer. In terms of yeah, it's this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't enjoy it very much. <laughs> yeah, it, it like I say, I think there's an interesting kernel of a story that could have been really interesting if that's what this story was about, and it's not. No. Instead, it's about the sort of the 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 young, presumably teenaged reader of the book. What if they were the only person who knew what was really going on in the town, and they saved the day, and all this sort of stuff? Because um, they also, you know, there's some very broad strokes with the plans where they the the barbarians drug a load of wine, and they've yeah. also taken the antidote, which is like a spicy pepper that only they like to eat. And yes. literally every other person in the in, in the castle seems to have drunk the wine and been knocked out, except for our three heroes. Yeah. Yeah, you can get away with these kinds of, you know, <laughs> very convenient sort of moments if your story is good enough to make me not care about them. But the story wasn't really good enough, so it just felt too convenient to get us yes. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt like too much of an important part of the story. Yeah, as a very weak part of the story, it's it's yeah. So yeah, not not one for me. This I I didn't I didn't get what I was hoping for from it, and unfortunately, this continues the the sort of run here of a story ending, just at, a, at probably it's more interesting point. So either we we don't get us we just don't have a satisfying ending to this story, like we've not had a satisfying ending to a couple of the stories so far. And that yeah. feels like a shame again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I would say that the the bad ones in this book are are, are much weaker than the than the, the less good ones in ignorant. Yeah, I think even that's true. the ones I like disliked most and thought they were a little bit strange. Still, a lot more to them that was worth discussion and, and interesting about them. Even the starboat was it was as much <laughs> as it was crazy. There was some really interesting parts to it. Whereas, yeah. I'm not even sure. The two of the stories here that are really that interesting at all. Mm. Um, it could be really harsh. To them. Yeah, it's interesting you raised the starboat because in the live chat, someone did mention that they, based on the name, the Hammer of the Stars, it mm. felt like that's the the territory we were about to go into again. And yes, I had a similar thought when I started reading it. I was like, oh, is this going to be another weird slan related adventure? And by the time I ended, I was wishing it was, it was. because that would have been more interesting. Yeah, if we, if, <laughs> than what we got was just a bit too plain. The magic wore off, and Brody turns out he was a slan who <laughs> 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 would find a halfling body who had been. <laughs> so yeah, I think oh. this one didn't. It just didn't land. It didn't land again. Pulg's Grand Carnival by Simon Ounsley. A young outcast by the name of Hans is on the way to the big city when he stumbles upon a dying man, the victim of highwaymen. This man gifts the young Hans with his only remaining possession, a magic flute of incredible power. It can control the will of men. On arriving in the city, Hans quickly finds himself in trouble and almost gets himself killed by thieves until the owner of a carnival, the selfish and irrepressible Polg, saves his life. Hans joins the carnival, looking after the many unusual creatures within it. But Polg can't be trusted, and he tries the patience of the people of this city, often falling foul of their political machinations. As things escalate and the carnival stands in danger, Hans must use his most powerful gift, accidentally causing more trouble than he expected. Whilst Polg may end up arrested and the carnival saved, there are quite a lot of bodies along the way. Polg's Grand Carnival. This one is the story I was referring to when I said there's a longer story that I ho I was quite frustrated by uh, mm -hmm. alongside Cry of the Beast. Because this felt long to me. This did not feel like a quick read. No, it was long. It was long. <laughs> and, it, and, and it didn't feel like it needed to be a long story. And 
in fact, it felt to me like it was two separate stories somehow merged mm -hmm. into one. I mean, what 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 was your general feel on this? You're right; it was long. So, in terms of uh, listening length, um, because when you read something, you always put it in perspective a number of pages. It was double the length of a lot of the others. It was about two really? hours. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was odd. It was it was very odd, and I, th I think you're right. It is. You feel like it's going to be a story about hands, and then. I, it, it's then it becomes a story about this sort of carnival of animals which is you know if it was just about a story about that it might have been a little bit better but it, it felt i don't know it, it felt like far too much of the story was 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 based around um civic council waste disputes <laughs> and and it felt like the chamber of commerce were about to get involved someone was going to contact their mp and and um <laughs> in a zoom meeting someone was going to get very very angry and say you have no authority here but it, it, it's it, there was an awful lot of sort of low level local politics in it but not in a good way we know we were arguing about um, waste disposal to start with there was that was sort of the theme for quite a lot of it we literally can't know where to get rid of their and um and then it was about well we're going to like a rat infestation it was very kind of you know, plant local planning laws came into it as well almost a little bit of <laughs> yeah. we want your land so we're going to make stuff up so we can build a a football a, a snot ball snot stadium ball, yeah. you know you know you could have this could be a story set in the home counties in a little village somewhere where they tesco's want to expand and the local Nimbies are uh, <laughs> trying to find ways to get rid of a local nightclub or something. It's it's odd, and I'm not quite sure why that was the the kind of focus of it. Because you have some interesting characters. Polg's a really interesting character. The, the nature of what he did and the beasts and things were a really good sort of background to having a a short story. I think you could have told a story around this carnival you know I, i'm not quite sure how he's walking around town with a with an or ivan it's it, it, yeah. it feels quite small but then at other times you know he's a big dangerous beast but other times they're walking down the street with him and he flies up and sits on a balcony with him at one point when he's in the pub i don't you know it's just how big is this balcony how small is this this wyvern um the heidi character is quite interesting as well i'm not sure why hans is there he's there purely to kind of deliver mm. the the flute which is just all a bit weird really and just sort of like is it going to be the pipe you know at one point when they were talking about getting rid of the rats i was thinking this better not be some kind of pastiche on the pied piper and he's going to use the, <laughs> the flute and dance off down the down the street um it was just odd i didn't i didn't sort of dislike it all the way through like a couple of aforementioned ones this evening because it was unusual enough and at times written okay it wasn't written terribly but i'm still not sure that the overall story was the right story to tell with those characters mm. yeah i'd agree with that it didn't feel like just you have these interesting pieces but then you've placed them into a story that's not a particularly interesting story i mean for me yeah it just didn't work at all that's even before you get to the sort of weird structural issues that i i felt there were where you've you start the story with quite a big hitting opening for a fantasy story. Oh, wow. Here's an old man who has given you a magical item and that magical item will let you do pretty much anything. You can control the will of anyone. Wow. What, what an incredible thing to get. I can only assume the rest of this story is going to be you either using it to do stuff and maybe learning a lesson because you do the wrong stuff, or it's going to be about you resisting the temptation to use it all the time, or it's going to be about you learning something about your life and yourself through the use of or having this magical item. Not at all. The magical item with this incredible power goes into the back pocket and doesn't come out again until the very end of the story yeah. where it, it it only exists to cause a minor issue that could have been caused in any number of other ways that would have yeah. made way more sense in the same yeah. scene. 
So it's kind of like, well, what? Why have you? Why have the magic flute in this story at all? When really this should just be a story about a young outcast boy who is taken under the wing of an interesting but unlikable carnival owner, P.T. Barnum, who then <laughs> exploits him and exploits the animals and exploits everybody else. Uh, may, uh, but then you could argue, well, but he's also given all of these animals a home. He's given this boy a home. So maybe he's doing something good by exploiting him. That's an interesting story. But no, we've we've then got a load of, like you say, all of the <laughs> the, the additional politics of it, which, again... I, I mean, in, it made in, me laugh. It amused yeah, me. Yeah, and in another some, story... There were some been good cool. lines in there, wasn't there? One of the... Ec- Talking about getting rid of the the the, the manure, the waste. There's an excrement of evil to be spread on that. No one wants the excrement of evil to be spread yes. on their vegetables. There's loads of really funny lines like that, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it was trying to be a comedy. There was, there was lots of bits that were sort of amusing. Yeah, I think um, there's a bit of. I think there's a little bit of humor in it, and I think it is trying to be, have a certain irreverence to it throughout. And listen, I think rat catching is a career in Warhammer fantasy role play. It's a famous part of the Warhammer world. So having that be a sort of part of your narrative is fine. It just n- needs to be a more full narrative overall, I would yeah. I would say. So yeah, it, it, it didn't come together for me, this one. And I think ultimately, like the magic flute is only used to stop some guards who are going to arrest Paul because he's finally gone too far. Or to make some buddies' trousers fall down as well at the beginning. I mean, don't forget that. That was a really important part of the story. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. Complete waste of power. <laughs> uh, it's super arbitrary. The flute will last forever, but it needs time to recharge itself. So you can only use it three times per year. This is like so arbitrary. Why? Why yeah, have but... you created rules like that? I don't know. <laughs> um, like you could. It could literally have just been you can only use it three times and it would have the yeah. same effect in the story. It would be but... more powerful. Yeah, be much more powerful. Yeah. And if it wasn't used to, to drop trousers and it was used <laughs> to get him out of a couple of scrapes and there was real dilemma about whether he needed could use it that final time mm. to save this guy who he's not sure he really likes, then it would have been more powerful. But yeah, yeah he's he's not had to save lives twice with it. He uh, yeah, he's yeah. dropped yeah. some and trousers the, the, and tried to save a girl. And The second time up. when he does use it on the guards, it interferes with a different magic that we hadn't been told about. That was mm-hmm. the reason the Wyvern was friendly, and yes. actually, it's a it, it is a monstrous beast, and it had been bound to pull. And this, the use of the magic flute for some reason, turned that spell off. Now, the some reason is that that is just convenient for the plot here. I think it awoke the, it it, it broke the spell that kind of awoke his senses. Woke him. Because the the the, the wyvern was the explanation for it, yeah, yeah. So it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, I think that makes sense more than why the Knights of the White Wolf might turn up to him and fix <laughs> a, three people at a carnival and loads of animals. That seemed a little bit overkill. Yeah, well, uh, friends in high places, I think, was the explanation for that one. Yeah, well, there's high pl- there's high places. I thought he meant at the local council. I didn't realize like <laughs> that's 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 like. Uh, well, if we go back to the original analogies of, of like the, the local women's institute complaining about, I don't know, some expansion of Tesco's, but the SAS turn up. It's kind of <laughs> slightly overkill. <laughs> it was. A little bit. I was it reading was. it, I thought, that, when it's mentioned the guard, I thought, yeah, the guard's fine. That's that's That makes sense. And it was like, then the Knights of the White Wolf, what were they doing there? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And the Wright's guard turned up and helped Kurt Helborg. And yeah, yeah he's, <laughs> I felt I, <laughs> it didn't. It just didn't. It d- didn't work for me. Ultimately, it did not work for me. I think a, a story about a carnival could be really fun. You know, there's mm. there's plenty of fun carnivals in the Warhammer world. I think a charlatan who's in charge of that could have been an interesting story. There's there's lots of interesting stories on the periphery of this, but all yeah. of it being sort of. The whole story being in service of getting the flute into Polg's hands so mm. that he can use it to maybe escape from being arrested. Yeah. I don't I, know. I don't feel like I needed a whole story to get to that place. No, and why would you? It's not interesting to get to no. that 
place anyway. I'd rather that St. Hans started at the carnival and the story was about him being given that and that's his tool to escape and his choice is to, yeah. you know, can I go on and do something with my life or do I save this this rather irritable man? Again, this, you could have definitely had some of those characters in there and used them without, well, not in the way they were. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe I'm being ungenerous and maybe there is something. So Heidi, she talks about the fact that she stays up late to wait for Paul to come home drunk because then yeah. that's a good opportunity for her to hit him on the head and you know have a little bit of revenge every day. Maybe there's something in that and, and like a broader yeah. theme. She, in order to do that, she's she's... He's subjected to his drunken advances and things as well, which is yeah, all sorts of stuff. Very nice, and uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's all a bit. Well, again, it's very sort of late eighties, early nineties. You'd you, that wouldn't be in the story now, I don't think. In the in the, it wouldn't be forgiven in the same way as it is because that was very much making a joke out of it. Oh, he's just drunk. We're definitely not in a time yeah. now where that would be an acceptable kind of story arc as something to be accepted in that way. But I don't know. I think I. I liked Heidi as a character, actually. I thought that could yeah. have worked. And uh, um, and her and Hans escaping at the end would have been a nice nice thing. And, but it felt all backward. Again, another unsatisfactory ending. I'd say so. Kind of... Yeah. Because it also escalated just out of nowhere. Like, Paul suddenly had had enough and just whips out some blunderbuss or whatever it is. And he, he's just sort of taking pot shots and stuff. So there's no sense that Paul himself... Is a canny operator. He he's oh, yeah. just, I guess, gotten lucky up to this point. I did feel a bit sorry for the giant rat that he just w was <laughs> happy to kill. I thought of you. I thought of you. When I <laughs> <laughs> well, because I mean, it's it's sort of described as just being a nice a nice giant rat, and then nice, in yeah. order to get rid of all of the rats and vermin in the whole place, this spell just takes the the giant rat out. I, I don't know why you couldn't have just taken the giant rat somewhere else when you did that spell i can't imagine yeah. there was a time pressure that prevented you from doing that but i guess that speaks to paul just not caring but not then the, caring, the yeah. sort of I think that was deliberate wasn't it? yeah i'm sure it was but you you kind of get to a so if he doesn't really care about any of the creatures in the carnival or the people in the carnival because because of how he treats everyone what does he care about and and if if he doesn't care about anything, surely the you would hope that Hans, by the end of the story, would have realized this. And that's what yes. Hans has learned is not to be taken in by just because this guy did one nice thing doesn't mean that you should then be loyal to him despite all of the bad things he does. But he yeah. still like ends up letting him get away with the flute and there's kind of a cheeky little blink. You know, he winks back to Hans as he's being dragged off and Hans is like, oh, yeah. He's got my magic flute and he's going to escape. Yeah, and it's it's. It's a bit hapless, isn't he? Hans yeah, it's like what have we learned? Strong. What have we learned? He doesn't here? go Nothing. on a journey at all. He almost feels deliberately half-witted to a point, doesn't he? I mean, yeah. Obviously, he has obviously yeah. he, ha he has challenges being an, an albino and that sort of brought into it, but also his his character is made out to be pretty stupid at times as well. Yes, feels, uh, you can you can understand how a young impressionable. Um, man might be swayed by someone who spends a lot of time talking them up, taking them to sure. the pub, buying them drinks and things. But he doesn't go on a journey of 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 discovering that. He seems to go on this kind of wavy journey of, yeah, he's a bit of an ass, isn't he? But then, oh, well, I don't think he ever even right. thinks that though. He kind of a little bit. I think yeah, maybe a little bit when he was when he was originally trying to persuade him to join the carnival he's saying if you just want me to be you know to be a freak in your show and i think he kind sure, of gets he, it yeah he does he does say that but he makes him sit outside the pub anymore to watch to watch the wyvern rather than going in the pub he seems so to there's take lots that of elements he's where he's fine with that though which, sort of but i think he's kind of like oh that's not very good but oh well and that's, <laughs> that's what yeah and that's my problem doesn't go on the journey where it gets to yeah the point no where journey it, no, i've had enough of his now yeah we need to move on yeah, and um, perhaps and if he if he had maybe if it was him rather than Heidi who had called the 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 Knights of the White Wolf in, yeah, uh, you know, and or if it was Heidi who did it, that he he makes a choice. You kind of create a situation where he can choose Polg or Heidi, 
And then that's a, he's got some agency and he's made a choice. Whereas the way it happens in the end of the story, he's just kind of buffeted along. It just, he happened to be stood on that side of the street and that's how it's played out. He's had no real impact on it other than bringing bringing this tool. And the way it should have ended would have been him and Heidi leaving, saving the animals and having the flu and waving at Paul because he gets dragged away for the (laughs) rest of his life in prison or or worse. Um, And that would have been a satisfying ending as much yeah. as you could do to a story that's a little bit weird. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't deliver the, you know, Polk's Grand Carnival is a good name and it kind of is like, this is going to be a fun setup and a magic flute. You know, I've, I know there's some pretty good stories about those already. So maybe this is going to be one and it didn't deliver on, on the, you know, in, in, <laughs> it, it's, it's the bottom of the stories about magic flutes list for me as well. So yes. I don't know. Not not a winner this one, unfortunately. Nope. <laughs> the Way of the Witchfinder by Brian Craig. Florian is a young priest of law, untested in the ways of the world. He goes on a mission of mercy to the town of Aurelame, where he hears untold stories of chaos corruption amongst the city's leaders. Though consumed with self-doubt, he steps in to try and stamp out this chaos influence and finds his faith tested both by temptation and by compassion. The Way of the Witchfinder, the second story in this collection by Brian Craig. What did you think about this? It's quite short, so it's... Very short, yeah. Yeah. Um, That surprised me. I thought, oh, this is as far as it's gone, is it? So, um, It felt odd to end with such a short story. Um, imagine that in the middle somewhere it wouldn't have been jarring maybe just that, was mm. a, that was a shorter one on to the next felt like you needed to end with something as 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 powerful as as we got trigger felix or or it ended with jack yeovil there that would have been a stronger ending but wouldn't it yeah, yeah I, I don't know it's a little bit i didn't i didn't enjoy it an awful lot um it's kind of got into that um sort of wispy unrecognizable warhammer for me uh, that i know that's probably relevant to its time or the, the gods of law i know that was that was warhammer fantasy role play at its time it's not something that in my fantasy role playing that we we kind of covered much so that's my that's, that's on me rather than the, the mm. storyteller so to speak um and the, the the basic premise of the story is okay you have a uh you have a, a, a sort of a young priest of law who's set set on this this challenge to prove himself and he does very very well to start with and then ultimately at the end it feels like he was his final test he he fails um because he has compassion um which is an interesting take and you don't know to mm. what level he fails because the, the story ends um <laughs> so you don't know the consequences of of that failure where there is any consequences because it ends it and that might be deliberately after your own imagination but um it was just too short to really kind of draw too much on i think but it but it was short enough that it didn't do too much damage in terms of going off any weird tangents so <laughs> it's got quite succinct um i mean obviously they when they put him in this this pit in the ground and cover him with this stone it reminds me of um, Grima Wormtum, when he whispers in the ear of Theoden and says, well, he's, to his guards, I told you to take the staff. <laughs> so from the film, when Gandalf gets in and he's sure. still got his walking stick, and he, because of he's got it, he's got his power. Well, why didn't they take the staff off him before they shoved him <laughs> in that hole? Because he uses the staff and the power to, to, to kind of get out of this thing. So they just took that staff off him. He'd still be in that hole, probably, wouldn't they? <laughs> uh, it just seems a little bit of straightforward. Just let 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 the wizard in, leave him with all his magical <laughs> items, and then wonder, wonder where he gets out. But um, yeah, I, I haven't got an awful lot more thoughts on that. It's in, it's interesting that the the, the plays around the, the the god of law and and soul can actually mm. having a bit of a voice in the story rather than just being something that's you know talked about as people worshiping that god. So that was interesting. Mm. Um, but um. It's not got any any depth to it to really explore that an awful lot more, I feel. Yeah, I think I agree. I don't think this was necessarily the, the strongest ending story. I mean, I think if no, no Gold in the Grey Mountains had ended this collection, then we'd be starting and ending on real strong stuff. Yeah. But for what it was, I actually didn't mind this story. I thought this is probably the, the better 
of the Brian Craig stories in here. It is brief, but there's something interesting in this version of the gods of law, I think, in, in a way that's probably more interesting than we saw them explored in Zaragoz. Mm. I quite like this, the mirror, the gods of law being a, a very mirrored image of the chaos gods, where they are yeah. just, obviously the chaos gods are just, you know, anything kind of goes, they, they have their sort of, they they have their spheres of influence or their interests or what have you, but it's it is a wild and wonderful kind of place in in the, you know worshiping those chaos gods, whereas the gods of law are totally unyielding. Mm. If you have faith in these guys, in order for them to give you whatever gifts they might give you and sort of do you know whatever your reward your faith in them, you have to be completely in line with their expectations and how you should worship them and how you should behave. And that can be a bad thing, even though law seems like it would be a good thing and they're mm -hmm. opposite of chaos and chaos are bad. Right. So they must be yeah. good. Well, no, actually compassion is not like that's frowned upon by the gods of law yeah. because it goes against their structured expectations of what you should be doing. So having compassion for someone and forgiveness for someone who's done something bad is just as bad and just as wrong to the gods of law as succumbing to temptation and being seduced by chaos. Yes. Like yeah. there's no difference. The gods of law, there's no gray. They are black and white as black and white as you can possibly get. And actually, yes. that's that's a really bad thing. So I think the, the gods of law could have been a very interesting faction to see in Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Uh, I think yes. if you think about this the, as this opposite of chaos, but just as evil in a different way, mm -hmm. where they are super, super ordered, and there is a very clear... You know, it's not like chaos where you've got all these weird mutations and everything's like a gross and strange... It's it's almost order to a level of like fractal abstraction. So it's it is mm -hmm. would drive you mad, but it's extremely ordered in some weird way. I can't I can't really even imagine it or verbalize what I'm trying to say. But I, I think that I, know, the, I think I know where you're going. There's something it, yeah, theoretically very cool about that. That if in a there is a world where Brian Craig and actually on the old Hammer Fiction podcast, Lewis talks about this as well. I think it's a great point. There's a world where Brian Craig's view of the Warhammer world is the one that is progressed through all of the mm -hmm. fiction and through all of the games. And actually, Estalia and Bretonia as the sort of medieval version of, of France and the gods of law become the cornerstones of Warhammer lore with a yeah. L O I E. <laughs> <laughs> and then and you you just end up with a Warhammer world that's totally unrecognizable to us, but it's totally leaning into all of the stuff Brian Craig was interested in. And then we'd be looking back at him and saying, this is the guy who's writing the foundational fiction for all of yeah, this cool yeah. stuff. Unfortunately for him, every subsequent writer said, I'm not interested in that. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's put all that to one side and we're going to go in a completely different direction. Well, but if, that, a lot of that other stuff was already in existence. He just... Yeah, and it, but it, the things he chose well. to focus on, for whatever reason, just ultimately kind of ended up being the stuff that was ousted from the setting, mm -hmm. really. Still there, but just not important to the setting. But yeah, I think there's, I think there is something... Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It inspired in me those thoughts of what would, what would a Warhammer Fantasy Battle army look like that worshipped Solkan? And I, I think that that could be very, very cool. Someone should do that project as a, as an army because I think that would be fascinating to imagine. I wonder if there's a um, there's a faction in War Machine, um, the Menoth, which are kind of religious zealots that are kind of ultra good, but maybe they're not so because they're so zealous in their beliefs and things. And I wonder whether, and this is why this is kind of dangerous to, talk about in some ways because you want to go down to area avenues we don't really want to cover in on a podcast but i do <laughs> feel that that kind of ultra law idea of ultra goodness but so unyielding in its mm. views um 
could lead you towards you know that kind of how good or like you said good becomes almost bad because of yes yeah. inability to show any compassion and uh, i think so yeah be interesting but you'd end it up would with be... some kind of almost fascist state couldn't you because it yeah. was so um prescriptive and of what you the way you should should be and you know like to kind of put yeah because it feels like a lot of with cyrene that yes she's clearly fallen to, to chaos gods but it also feels like that we're, we're at the point of it's not just pure evil there's a lot of enjoyment there and it's mm. almost like law is going stop having fun <laughs> you're not like yeah have fun. Um, yeah absolutely and, and that's maybe is good that they didn't kind of go down that road for the the background because it would have been a little bit too I don't know, close I, to I just and, religion, I, and this is maybe not not in the text at all but just whilst i'm here mm. i'm imagining what would what would the equivalent of chaos mutations be for law gods of law mm, it's interesting uh, yeah and so and an example just and this might be a very basic version of this but imagine if you're if like the mutations were almost like your body became like geometric and and the, yeah. like you know you because it's because all of the sort of you know the fleshiness of a human is totally flawed and totally the, the organic this is where stuff it gets is, dangerous because you start looking at purity and, and yeah and, no but and then, then it so, becomes problematic I think. oh absolutely it's, kind of, it's problem but then yeah. these are not good guys so the gods of law yeah. are not good guys but so imagine like your hand which is like weird and has all of these odd shapes and does all of these odd things actually then becomes just like a, a block a cube yeah you know the perfect shape and like <laughs> that that is the mutation that you get from the gods of law is that your hands become just like granite blocks and things yes. like that or you might have i'm imagining in the in the i think it's snow white and the huntsman where yeah. there is a, a sort of magical army that's created by the evil queen who are almost made out of glass. So when they get struck, they just shatter into uh, glass. Okay. And then, you know, these kinds of weird shapes and sort of materials, I think there's something interesting. But like I say, that's not in this I th story I at all. I think it but works it was... better in, in Warhammer 40,000, where uh, where perceived purity um, is something that you see in Mechanicum and Mechanicus, mm. where they will get rid of the superfluous bits, they will improve themselves. And it, it, there's no, you know, it's... There's no need for that humanity. We just want to be the best. So rather than purity, it becomes what they believe is their their the right. Yeah, that's a fair and point. In, in many ways, that's just as horrible. Yeah. Um. And as 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 the the chaos side of things, because there's still mutilation there. But uh, yeah, it's, um, interesting, yeah. but harder in a fantasy no, setting. Yeah. And none of this is in this story. But I was just moved to because if we have here a story that I thought was interesting and I was concerned with the gods of law. Yeah. They kind of sparked some interesting thoughts. And I think that's what the good that's what a good fantasy story should be. It should be like helping you imagine this world and explore a different yeah. aspect of it. So I think it worked in that respect. Also, when he was trapped in that cell and he was just chanting this prayer for three days, and it sort of then he was able to just walk through materials, through objects, through space, and just walk mm. up to the tower. That really reminded me of like Avatar the Last Airbender or or Korra. Yeah. And there yeah. was, you know, these sort of elemental powers where you could just fold earth around you and just walk straight through a mountain or a building. And yeah. that was a cool visual to me. I was just imagining it's just that. The stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should have taken the stuff of him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was yeah, it was good. It was good. I, I suppose another point to we're talking about the purity of the power. Maybe that's just Soul Can's view of how priests of of law should be, maybe not how all mm. followers of of law would be. So sure, know, if these are the paragons, harsh of... lesson, yeah. um, and, and and yeah, that that's it. So maybe maybe that every follower of law shouldn't be uncompassionate at that moment. Mm. Um, well, and then there's all the sort of like the curse or the the because of his failure, is that the reason? the the sea is going to come and claim the city back so the city's built yeah. on the sands on the beaches I felt like that was always going to happen anyway well, yeah and then but then that, that's so. kind of an interesting kind of point as well isn't it i mean this is what this is you know people attribute to the gods these devastating events and you yeah. could say well if he prayed harder not fall into the temptation of pity yeah maybe solkan would have spared the city 
we've i mean these stories are familiar from a certain other book that's quite <laughs> prevalent in, in the real world and, and again maybe that's why it's safer to stay away from them because there's a lot more familiarity with with that and the way that the... <laughs> sure and yeah and it just it was an interesting one i mean what the the other thing that sprang to mind was uh, Mont Saint Michel as the city on the sea, mm. like actually in the sea, basically on the beach, yeah. uh, you know. And I, and I think that was quite that's a nice visual. I'm, it feels like maybe that's what inspired it. Is it Mont Saint Michael? Do you think? Sorry, Mo yeah, yeah. No, no, I know. I mean, is it the real? I wonder if that's where the idea. That's is, what I mean. Is, yeah, is did, yeah. Did, did it? Did it? You know, just a sit uh, like a towering city built onto a beach, and the yeah. sea will always claim it back that kind of is totally where my mind went at the start yeah. of the story. I, uh, I imagine so. I mean, I, I, I've been there this summer. Sure, <laughs> yeah. And um, and it, it's a wonderful place. And yet it does feel like you're walking around um, a Bretonian city. And I can see um, how that would be a lovely setting for this. So yeah, that, that, that gives you a really good idea. So yeah, yeah. not just being reclaimed by the sea yet. Luckily, <laughs> that's because the <laughs> prayers to Soul Clan. Yes, have, have absolutely. Yeah. They're all playing to Soul Clan in there. That's why. <laughs> there was an odd thing in this story, though, where it didn't work for me. And that was that Florian, who is sort of positioned as a bit of a naive young priest. So this is his first journey out on a mission. Yeah. And he sits down in the center of the sort of town square and he's hearing for several days all of these tales and it's it's positioned as if he's hearing gossip and yes. it's very much the the sort of vibe i got from the story was that you'd be a bit naive and foolish to believe everything you believe heard yes yeah the, the truth is amplified into something that's more exactly acute, you know use a rumor so maybe think and that sort of kind of brings you back to well how bad is Cyrene? is she how bad then, how bad is the lot of all the people sure that, that and then he there? but he and acts that brings on you back to that gossip. interplay of what's good and bad about the the two gods at the end, with the showing lack of of, of uh, compassion, or who is we don't, the real bad guy at the end. So yeah, we don't get enough good. of that though. I think because Florian then acts on all of this information he's been given, which we we are led as readers, we're led to believe that it's probably not all true. But when he confronts Cyrene, it is all true. So yeah, he was right to confront. It? Yeah, it was the right thing to confront her. She is evil. She is in league with chaos. Maybe you could argue that then the compassion thing sort of tips the balance back into you know not everything's black and white. But I don't know. It just didn't. The fact that that his faith is very much about law and things being black and white, true and false, binary states, and yet the way he comes about the information is the opposite of that. Yeah, it didn't feel like it quite made sense to me. Probably needed more time to explore yeah, that. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, overall, it prompted some very interesting thoughts in my head. It was it was certainly not my favorite of the stories, but because it was so short, it was just this little tiny exploration of this sort of corner of the world that we we won't see too much more of in time. Obviously, we will yeah. because we've got Brian Craig stories to come. <laughs> But in the wider Warhammer world, this is just something that's of an older era. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was nice. I think it was be lovely in the middle of the book as a little yeah, kind of I agree interlude. Okay. So, where did you feel that this collection of stories, so Wolf Riders as a book, is this as good as Ignorant Armies? Is it better? It's hard to compare it to the novels, but where were you sort of mm. placing this? this? Is a fourth book we've read from GW Books? Um, yeah, it's at the bottom out of the four. Um, right. As much as it's got two very good stories in, two very, very good stories in, but I think the rest, there's a significant amount that are, are, are disappointing other than just kind of interesting. Well, I probably wouldn't read it again, but I'm glad I read it. Some of these, you know, it's I didn't really, the first time I didn't, properly didn't enjoy things rather than I didn't enjoy parts of a story hmm. or that was a bit strange. Some of the, there were the stories here that I genuinely just didn't enjoy at all. And, <laughs> and they had me chuckling, you know, but at stages, but, uh, um, you know, Paul's grand carnival was amusing, but it wasn't great, but, uh, how of the stars just wasn't good. Uh, um, and, um, cry the beast really wasn't good. Hmm. Um, not a huge fan of the Phantom of Euromore as well. It was okay at times, but 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of ones that I thought it, it, it lost a lot of pace. It lost a lot of momentum earlier on. Mm. Um, and it kind of detracts from the, the couple of the better. So you, you've forgotten, but the time you get to the end, it's very easy to forget how strong that it started. And I think it needed to start strong with with uh, with Bill King. I think there's probably a reason why he's there at the beginning of the book. Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's like a uh, it's like a, a bottom of the table football team that's got a, a, a two good players in that <laughs> just about keep it in games and give you some hope that that that, it, that they can win. Um, but um, there's a lot of weakness in there. Um, yeah, I don't disagree. I do think the highs were pretty high. So the the, the two stories, I think, Wolf Riders itself and No Gold in the Grey Mountains were both great. I really enjoyed great. them. No Gold in the Grey Mountains, I think, is was super strong for me. I, I had a great time with that. And then the Italian Rat, I also really, really liked. Despite my qualms about its ending, I, it was just a great read for me. Mm -hmm. And then Phantom of Remy, I thought, was a fun story to read, if not to then sort of reflect on afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Same with The Way of the Witchfinder, really. That sort of falls into that camp. And then, yeah, we've got then three stories that just didn't tick any boxes for me really um so yeah it's a, it's i would agree it's probably the, the the weakest as a book of the four books that we've read but some of the stories in here are going to stay with me and i will be revisiting and i am looking forward to more mm -hmm. from from those authors and characters yeah would you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down do you think Oh, it's really difficult because I was just thinking as you were talking a bit about what you were saying about the, some of the stories would stay with you. And I'm trying to think about would those stories stay with me? How have we not been doing this process? Um, I can confidently say that they wouldn't have had a second read, stroke, listen. Um, so maybe they wouldn't. They would have been kind of pushed aside and forgotten relatively quickly. So if I'm mm. being honest with that sense, then you remove the two really strong stories and it would be a thumbs down it is whether i can kind of do that because of them <laughs> <laughs> you can't um, this is this is the gods of law you need a binary um, on this one up or um, down well as my favorite story that appears in another book it's saved <laughs> so i'm going to say a thumbs down Ooh, um, first thumbs down we've got yeah yeah so. <laughs> for me I'm going to go thumbs up still because I, I, the stories I liked, I really liked. I thought they were great. And even some of the stories that were mixed for me, I think were still really worthwhile. So yeah, I think all, frustrations aside, I still really enjoyed reading the collection. Um, mm -hmm. And I've got questions about, you know, why were there not more stories about dwarves? Why are there not more stories about elves, more stories about halflings? At least we get a couple in this. Why so many stories about the same kinds of characters, whether that's because that was the brief, you know, write a story about a teenage boy in, in the yeah. Empire or Bretonia. Maybe that's what they were told to do. But I think for all of the missed opportunities, there's still stuff in here that I enjoyed. And, and that's why I'm giving it the thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it, yeah, it's definitely still bits I enjoyed. That's, that's, yeah. that's undeniable. Um, but the danger is everything will just have a thumbs up because there'll be little bits <laughs> I, I enjoyed. And if I'm really, as I said, if I'm trying to step back from the process and really enjoying having these conversations and having a lot of fun with it, especially some of the bad ones in some ways, if it brought a lot of enjoyment, but more to do with the discussion afterwards um, than the reading reading the story. Um, if I was just reading it as a book alone, I would have got to the end and thought, well, I only liked a couple of those stories. One of them I've read before because of it's part of a, a long series I love. Um, mm -hmm. and that leaves you one very, very good but quite short story from by, by um Kim Newman. Yeah. Yeah, it's fair. The rest it's I totally could fair. very much live without. Um <laughs> and that and that's why it would be a thumbs down. Well, that's where I guess we'll end it for now on Wolf Riders. We've got a hiatus in December. So we're not going to be doing any of the GW Book Club in December, but we will be returning in January with Conrad. So that's the start of a new trilogy. So that's something 
that I'm quite looking forward to. I've never read Conrad, so I'm I'm keen to see how that plays out. Uh, when we do get back into it, you can join me on my Patreon live stream if people are interested in that, where we actually get together and talk about it at length. I think our talking <laughs> a session live stream session for Wolf Riders was about three hours in the end because we had so much of stuff to go through and talking about all the different aspects of it. So we'll be doing that again for Conrad uh, in the middle of Jan. And then we will be back, Stu, on the YouTube channel with the next episode of the GW Books Club. In the meantime, where can people find you? Miniature Realms, um, YouTube first. Um, and then you can catch me on all the, the major social medias as well um, at Miniature Realms. Fantastic. I'll put links in the description to that as well. And you've just launched a Discord as well, haven't you? I have, yes. I just finally, I just hit 10,000 subscribers on the channel. So I, I, I used it as an excuse to launch a Discord uh, and a patron as well now as well. So uh, if you are thinking of looking at the channel, go and have a look at those as well. Fantastic. I'll put the links to those. I've also got a Patreon and a Discord as well. So you can join that. Come and join us on both. <laughs> Lots of great conversations. Give us Lots both all the stuff. money. <laughs> <laughs> but until next time thank you very much for watching i am jordan and this is jordan sorcery <laughs> <laughs>